9 to 5 from 1980 Review and Thoughts. So, happy early Women's History Month. I feel like this movie works for Women's History Month, but I continue to be worried that stuff I want to vlog about will leave Disney Plus really soon. I realize March is not very far away, but still. So, yeah, that's why I'm doing it now. I promise I will not at any point in this video build out any Dolly Parton. In fact, I will not sing at all. So, I am going to start by telling you this was a movie I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into a number of serious subjects. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that it's not as much fun to watch today, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will go into the politics, though. So, I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. Now, I am a lifelong feminist, but I am a cishet man, and as such, I have never lived as a woman, cis or trans. I try to show empathy and listen to the lived experience of women, but I am aware I have blind spots, and as such, I might accidentally say something ignorant, so if any woman is bothered by something I say in one of these videos, please let me know. I am open to editing that part out, and if it is a case where the whole video is bad, taking it down. Now, the movie is rated PG, and... This was before the PG-13 rating, which was introduced in 1984. That one would have made more sense, you know, given that it couldn't have been PG-13. If it wasn't PG, it would have been an R rating, which would really misrepresent how light it is. But it definitely does get into some subjects that a PG is a bit misleading. I, I do understand why it wasn't this movie. The actual movie that did introduce the, the PG-13 rating, I forget what it's called. I want to say it was the... It was one of the Indiana Jones movies. I think it was the Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I can understand why that one was a PG-13. Why that one introduced that, that rating and this one didn't. That one definitely does have stuff that is a bit more out there than... Not, not saying it's a bad movie, but yeah. But it does, like, if you're watching... If you're watching this video right now, and you haven't watched this movie yet, and you're seeing it has a PG rating, I would say think of it more as a PG-13. You know, I've, I've seen a couple of reviews by people who were like, outright, like, really put off by the fact, but by the actual movie, because they thought it was going to be what today counts as a PG movie. Now, the, yeah, there are no details for why the MPA rated it this, the way, rated this movie the way it did on IMDb. Now, I think the reason why is that there, you know, there are hints at for example, sex and, you know, yeah, there, there are some subjects. A lot of it will go over the head of young viewers, and it's not like, there are, there are implications of, like, you know, one of, one of the characters has a gun, and, you know, yeah. There are definitely some things that, you know, younger viewers might ask parents about things, and then, you know, the parents have to come up with something to say. But it's not the kind of thing where, you know... Yeah, I'm not going to give away whether or not the gun is fired in this movie, but I will say it doesn't show blood, for example. You know, so that would obviously get it a higher rating if it was actually that, that, you know, but, yeah. Now, that brings, but, but yeah, ratings wise, like, most of the, I, yeah, actually, I think all of the MCU movies are rated PG-13, so, yeah, I, I would definitely say 
if you wouldn't show an MCU movie to your your kid based on the you know if it's not on account of politics or such but on account of what they're willing to show maybe don't show this to them either now you know in in general if you are a parent try to watch it for yourself before but i realize you know if you are working nine to five you might not have time to watch everything that you want your kids to be able to see at some point before watching it with them now i have only watched this once but i did watch the original cut this it wasn't like edited for tv or something and yeah my one viewing i literally just got done watching it I, you know yeah, got done watching it, set up the lights, the camera, and now I'm vlogging, so it is very fresh in my mind. Now, the plot. I am going to use the IMDb description. Three female employees of a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot find a way to turn the tables on him. And that's actually, there. there's a... That's said multiple times, and it... Just, it's it's so great to see them really call him on the, the BS that he pulls. So, yeah. Now, the, yeah, so the MDB more like this list compares this to Steel Magnolias, Overboard, The First Wives Club, the, um, the mini, nah, not mini, the, the, the uh, TV series. Also called 9 to 5, Moonstruck, Tootsie, On, Golden Pond, Private, Benjamin, Mr. Mom, Fried Green Tomatoes, Beaches, and Working Girl. Now, I gotta say, I have not watched any of those movies, so I can't really speak to, but certainly several of them are also female-centered, so, yeah. And the, I'm, uh, the Disney Plus suggested section has Big Business, Working Girl, The Jewel of the Nile, Romancing the Stone, Can't Buy Me Love, Say Anything, Adventures in Babysitting, and never been kissed and those are also movies that it's, you know there's a little bit of overlap but the ones that aren't overlapped also haven't watched i i do watch uh, a number of female centric films just not really yeah not not those it's not that i've been avoiding them is what i'm trying to get across and that brings us to the writing. So, the. Yeah, this was written by Colin Higgins, RIP, and Patricia Resnick. Now, Colin Higgins also directed it, and he also wrote and directed Foul Play and. Not fond of that word. I guess I will... The uh, the best little in Texas. Which also stars Dolly Parton. And other than that, he has written some TV. And... Yeah, I, guess I, I am not familiar with anything else that he's written or directed. And Patricia Resnick... Other than this, has written some TV, and let's see, the, ah, uh, yeah, I did oh, oh, no, not that, yeah, she wrote Expendables, but not that one, a, a 2000 movie called The Expendables. She wrote the screenplay for Straight Talk, which also has Dolly Parton seemingly starring. And... Um, yeah, she's, she's written a couple of other female-centric things. I think she did a really great job here. Um, ultimately, I don't know what parts of this were written by her and what was written by him because unfortunately apparently he like if i understand correctly he let her visit the set once and that's it you know so that's bitterly ironic for a movie that's literally criticizing men taking credit for women's work 
but yeah, I I can't say for sure who you know who should be credited, and apparently some theorize that Lily Tomlin changed some of her lines to fit her kind of brand of, of comedy, which I don't think I've seen her in anything else. Uh, unfortunately, I'd like to. She does really well here. But what I'm trying to get to is there's a lot of jokes that really land well here. So, yeah, I've, I'll, um, I'll talk about when I get into critic quotes about that because some people disagree on how funny it is. So, anyway... I have only watched this version. I cannot compare it to the TV show or the musical. I can absolutely imagine. Like, I'm not sure how involved Dolly Parton was with the the TV show. If I understand correctly, like, the role... Th th this was back when TV was seen as a step down. You know, today you do have Hollywood stars, like, g going for TV and streaming roles as well. But back then, it was basically, you know, if she if she agreed to do a TV show, that might have really slowed down her movie career. Which I know, I don't know very much about, but I do know that, you know, certainly I can understand why this led to something of a movie career for her. Because she's fantastic here. Like, I know some people are saying, oh, she's basically playing herself. But if you actually try acting, like, try, if you, if you have the the means try to like yeah if you just got like a webcam just you don't have to show it to anyone just like try to to act into the webcam and just watch it back yourself a lot of people don't realize how much it does take even if you are only playing yourself if you if you aren't happy and you have to pretend to be or, yeah act as if you're happy or if you aren't sad and you have to act sad, you know, these things, yeah, so, the, but, but yeah, Dolly Parton was apparently very, you know, I don't know 100%, I didn't research the musical very much, but apparently she took, she, you know, yeah, she took some, something of an active part in that, that makes a ton of sense to me. And turning this into a musical, like, there's a bunch of things that I really, I, like, I get why, like, the, the energy and the creativity of something, like, the original animated, yeah, the, yeah, the original Lion King, technically the new one isn't live action, it's just 3D animation, CG animation, the 2D animated Lion King, I get why people look at that and are like, wow, you know, I, I, it's, it's one of my favorites, you know, that Aladdin, again, original. Ah, uh, crap. What's the third one? I can never remember the third one for some reason. Beauty and the Beast, that's it. Those three, I think, are really, really, you know, really show that Disney animation can do amazing things. I really don't see how you turn The Lion King into a musical. So I'm not saying that, like, oh, everything should be music. You know, to each their own. It's fine. I'm, if you love it, great. But me personally, I don't really see how you turn that into a musical. I totally see how you turn this into a musical. Also, apparently, according to Wikipedia, Horrible Bosses is a sort of spiritual successor to this. I haven't watched that one. I don't intend to. Really, I think it's kind of sad that when women finally get to do something without men trying to take control of it, the spiritual successor centers men. Thankfully, that is not the only spiritual successor, and several of the others still focus on women, and some came out soon after this did. It struck a chord. People wanted more, is what I'm trying to say. And, it, yeah, this has been compared to stuff like Office Space, which I think there's a lot to love about Office Space. I do wish that one wasn't as sexist as it is, but there definitely is, you know, and, and it is, like, yeah. This movie is about women not being appreciated in the workplace, and then some white dudes come around and say, oh, you know, we're being, we, we hate working 9 to 5 too. And it's like, why can't you just lift up women? Why, did, why do you have to center it? on this? Anyway. 
Yeah, this is the kind of progressive movie that I love to highlight. It was written in part by a woman, the three stars were women, and these women, all of them exploited labor, work together rather than competing with each other, and the antagonist is a misogynist male boss who abuses his power, and in fact the three women are different from each other and there are issues at first, but they overcome them as I'll get... As, as I'll discuss more when I get to the characters, thus making their union, wink wink, less likely, and underlining that many women are overlooked and all women deserve to be recognized for their work, not only one type of woman and not only one job type. And I am just quickly gonna do that. There we go. So, the song Beyond just being really catchy, is legitimately a great expression of the many grievances of working women. Some say it is about the 925 movement, which certainly inspired the movie, and is an extremely important movement. And, yeah, you know, the the for sure, like, the song really captures the, you know, if, if you've only ever heard the song, the, you know, the movie is basically showing what she's singing about with yeah whenever we imagine things that we'd like to be able to do when someone has treated us unfairly it's easy to just settle for something that makes you feel better even if it doesn't necessarily improve things so i really appreciate that this is a movie that has the maturity to actually present a healthy alternative to the negative that it's criticizing even though judging by some user reviews some people thought that the healthy alternative looked as bad or even worse than what it's criticizing that's the risk you run when you argue for things being better, some people won't understand. And I will discuss in detail when I get into the spoiler sections. Now, the... let's see... And it is also, you know, it is not an anti-capitalist movie. It is an anti-exploitation movie, which... You know, some people would say there's no real difference. Let me rephrase that. Basically... The movie is about exploited labor getting more, you know, evening things out. It is not trying to overthrow capitalism. It's just asking, it's basically asking for regulation and equality. Now, you know, just in case you're not far enough left to agree with overthrowing capitalism... Now, the movie is not exaggerating when it goes into the things that the women have to deal with, only in stuff like what they wish they could do. And I think this is very much on purpose. Honestly, parts of this could basically serve as a PSA on, for example, sexual harassment. It's a movie that takes women's rage and frustration seriously. It's not making fun of them, as otherwise frequently happens under patriarchy. The idea of hysteria is inherently misogynistic, a way to dismiss women when they express strong emotion that goes against what the men near them want. And, yeah, you know, the for example, there are, you know, at on at least one occasion in this movie, a woman will confront a man who has wronged her, and where a lot of male-centered movies would just have the woman, like, screaming incoherently, trying, you know, basically othering her, you know, here they are well-spoken. Yeah, you know, they get angry, but they're always well-spoken and well-argued. They, they don't say things that are completely ridiculous. So, yeah. Absolutely love that. Uh, yeah, I, I can't help but wonder if that was maybe Patricia Resnick, uh, you know, making sure that that would be in the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that brings us to critic quotes on the writing aspect. So, yeah, some, some people say that the... Um, the, the dialogue is not clever and funny. Yeah, I don't... I don't really agree. I, I thought they did a really great job. Like, I suppose it's not like... Not all of the dialogue is like rip-roaring hilarious. But it's always pretty funny. Like, when, whenever it's trying to be. There are a couple of times where it's just like neutral. Just, But, yeah, I, w I would say almost all of the laughs work. There are maybe... Yeah, I, I don't... 
I wouldn't really say that there are very many that that don't work. One thing some people really didn't like is that the the there are there are parts of the movie that are in contrast with other parts and I can understand why some people are, are really bothered by that. I mean, I think to an extent, I feel like the movie does the, it does a, a really good job bringing up these, these grievances. And then like, once you've really established, okay, these are the problems that women are facing. I don't know, I mean, at that point, you kind of either have to go... You know, I, I'm glad that it doesn't start out ridiculous. And I, I acknowledge some people reject it because it gets ridiculous. I'm not sure how else you you kind of do have to go ridiculous once the... Yeah, once the grievances have been established. Like, if you're going to make it even funnier because at the very start like it's funny from right away but at the very start of the movie it's this very slice of life kind of it's funny because it's true and then later it's funny because it's outlandish and i i don't think maybe you know what it's possible that the sitcom version m managed a more even tone and, uh, yeah, considering it's an 80s sitcom, it probably was kind of ridiculous also. You know, these are the days of, of stuff like the, the um, you know, the majority of... Uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. Um, Married with Children. The majority of that is is quite ridiculous. There's very early on. Some of it is very down-to-earth, but it gets very ridiculous and stays that way. Clearly, that was what the audience responded to. One of my favorite sitcoms. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, for sure, the sitcom, very likely also ridiculous. Yeah, honestly, maybe today you could do a more toned-down. That's actually, yeah, um, every so often, I'll dur during my research, I would come across like mentions of oh you know this you know it it is looking like now they will do a, a sequel let's see when was the last um so yeah uh 2019 oh uh oh yeah yeah uh so yes, in in um, let's see, in 2018 they they were talking about wanting to do it, and then October 30th, 20 uh, yeah 2019, Halloween movies you know ha Halloween surprise, D Dolly Parton announced the sequel had been dropped. Now, um, but the the yeah the the three actresses made a full reunion. Uh, let's see, uh, Grace and Frankie in, uh, yeah, last year, but yeah, I think it would be great to, for, for them to do a, a sequel, but yeah, um, I th certainly I think if they, if another version is made, I think it would be great if they at least appeared, you know, may, even just as, like, a, a torch passing kind of thing, maybe. But, yeah, if they did another version today, I would like to see a, a version that, that does stay very close to just... Because, yeah, you know, certainly parts of Office Space mine a lot of comedy. You know, yeah, there's some ridiculous aspects, but a lot of the time it is just kind of showing how bad it is and yeah i i do think that it is possible to do one today that is but but yeah now let's 
see, um, yeah, uh, multiple critics point out the fantasy sequences in this are hilarious. They're just, they're so good. You know, if, if you're 100% certain you're not going to watch the movie for, you know, regardless of your reason, try to at least watch the music video for the song and the fantasy sequences because they're just so good. Now, let's see. Yeah, there's one critic who says, I didn't hate it, but it's just a bit too tonally uneven to really recommend it. Um, yeah, and some people say, oh, it's terribly dated. Most of the workers' rights the women demand from their bosses are standard workers' rights these days, although some still aren't. That doesn't make it dated. That makes it a time capsule, same as the 80s tech, which I also saw people say, ah, oh, you know, how can you take a movie seriously that has technology that we don't today? Like, some people just don't know how to watch movies that aren't, like, brand new. I, I, yeah, it's, it's beyond me. Anyway, you know, when I was a kid, my, my parents were showing me movies that were decades old, you know, stuff that they had grown up with and, and such. So I've never really had a problem going back and watching something that's that's old. You know, this this movie is 43 years old now. You know, it's it's older than I am. Now, um but but yeah, I really I I hugely disagree. I I take issue with the the idea that if something shows a world that in some ways has been improved upon, that means that the movie, you know, it's a bad thing that the movie shows. I think it is extremely important for movies to express, you know, values and, and challenge the values that you think are unacceptable so that, you know, I mean, yeah, there are some of, some of the things that are, you know... There's plenty of people working, you know, minimum wage who don't have, you know, who, who also don't have the things that this movie shows not having. You know, it's we're not talking about something that, you know, like, let's say you made a movie about how bad, like, uh, let's see, what was one of those? Was polio one of the diseases that was under control? Although now, because of anti-vaxxers, some diseases have made a comeback, but... You know, I could maybe... No, no, yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly it. Because of stuff like anti vax you're, you're always going to have people trying to make things worse. You know, whether it's because they've been misinformed like anti-vaxxers, or they just, you know, they're, they're just too greedy to... to they, they can't stand when things get better for other people if it means that they lose some money from that, even if they have so much that they can't even, you know, they wouldn't even notice it. If you, like, if it just happened without them being told, they wouldn't even notice it. That is not the case for minimum wage workers. When you make things worse for them, they can tell, you know. So, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, I, I just, I completely disagree with the argument that a movie, I, I think a movie can be dated, but it's stuff like, you know, if it's very misogynistic, then it's, you know, that that makes it dated because it's m much more difficult to sit down and watch today, even though some things about it might be good. Now, uh, let's see, yeah, some... Uh, yeah, this guy says, the worst thing about this movie is it's completely silly humor bordering on farce. Parts of it are almost childish, and I skipped those parts. Yeah, so that is how some people feel. I, I don't agree. I think it works. I, I feel like as long as you're doing it well, and they are doing it well, and it's not, like, I, I would agree if... If it was promoting really awful values, or if it was just like, yeah, like I don't, I'm not really a fan of gross out comedy, or certainly not the way people do it today. I can, you know, I'm, I'm okay with gross out comedy from, again, you know, married with children, two and a half men, that kind of thing. But, you know, gross out comedy movies today, I find are just, they go way too far for my taste. And that's, but, Something being farcical, 
the only, you know, obviously if you're not into it, then you're not going to like the movie, but I don't think that's a problem with the movie. I think that, you know, that just means that it's not for you. You know, you don't see me, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do a review of the Lion King musical and talk about how I don't really like musicals that much. Like, well, you know, I, I really don't understand why people struggle in reviews to, to divorce the two. I do agree that the tone is somewhat uneven and, like, at the start, it is 100% down to earth. At the very start of the movie, it's basically, like, you could be watching the opening sequence of this movie and be like, wow, yeah, been there, you know. And then, you know, later in the movie, it's like, wow, this is, this is not really what I signed up for. This is not what I thought this movie was kind of thing. So, yeah. Now, let's see, and, um, let's see, so, um, yeah, one critic says, every male character is a potential macho, and from that axiom, the whole, uh, yeah, the plot line is traced, it might explain the film's new popularity in a time where men became targets, and misandry as systemic as the, mis as the misogyny it denounces, wow! You are not living on planet Earth, my friend. And we're also not friends. Now, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, he says the movie never elevates the uh, certain th aspect of the movie above the sitcom level. I mean, I feel like if, if it got too real it would stop being funny and start being, like, legitimately uncomfortable. You know, I, I would say there's at least one part of the movie that made me cringe, but it was supposed to. Uh, yeah. Now, yeah, the movie handles plot twists quite well. The, you know, there's... I won't give away how many, but there are multiple plot twists, and everything worked within the logic. Like, I'll grant that, that you know, it's like some of the Simpsons, like rubber band reality, kind of, you know, some of the time it's very real, some of the time it's kind of ridiculous. But at the end of the day, like, I wouldn't say that the movie ever violates its own logic, for example. the The stuff that... You know, yeah, the plot twists surprise you, but there are things, you know, it, it makes sense. The things that are in the movie, yeah, you know, there, there wasn't a single plot twist in this where I sat back and I was like, I don't, how could that possibly? No, it is, it all makes sense within the logic. Now, that brings us to the direction. So, yes, the, the three movies that Colin Higgins, R.I.P., directed are Foul Play with Chip Chase and Goldie Hawn, this and The Best Little Hawn in Texas, which also starred Dolly Parton. And, yeah, I cannot compare this to the... Because I don't even, you know... I think I did used to watch Chevy Chase movies, and certainly I watched a bunch of Goldie Hawn movies. A foul Play is not one of them... And, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested, you know, but the, let's see, yeah, I will, I will start with critic quotes about direction, so, uh, let's see, yeah, so this is a person who says, I just watched this movie for, the, yeah, they gave it a 10 out of 10. Still, uh, I just watched this movie for the first time in 2020. I haven't laugh laughed so hard for a movie in some time. I loved all the performances. It's depressing that a lot of what they had to fight against is still happening in 2020. But it's a great reminder that there are smart, talented, and ambitious people whose legacy we carry on by fighting for equality. And let's see. As a casual fan of Grace and Frankie, it was really fun to watch Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin working together back in 1980. Honestly, this 
This movie has it all. Dolly's amazing songs, the comedic timing of Lily Tomlin, the justice of Jane Fonda, friendship between women, getting revenge on a horrible tyrant of a man. If you think you're too good for this movie, think again. This movie is too good for you. I am on the Dolly train to Dollywood. Now, let's see... Okay, so this person says, I found the plot very thin generally. Once the office situation and the characters had been set up so well, there was nowhere for the movie to go. Certain scenes were tedious. Too many scenes. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to see the film maybe a bit more episodic instead of settling into one specific story angle for so much of it. Also, I think the film's formula is too rigid and it ends up restricting the characters. Hmm. The zany scenes clash too much with the serious scenes and makes the whole thing feel a bit haphazard. It's not directed with any vision that would have united them. That is, yeah, I think a, a no, no disrespect to Colin Higgins, but I do, there are comedy directors who could have made these very disparate tones work together. Now, uh, the star performance play off one another nicely. Higgins has the good sense to emphasize their strengths. Tomlin, the comedian, fond of the dramatic actress and down-home musical celebrity Parton come together. Now, yes, yeah, so to briefly talk about, yeah, you know, once, yeah, once the office situation and the characters are set up, Honestly, um, I can't help but wonder if this maybe would have made a really great short film, or, or a, you know, a, an even better short film than it is a movie. Because yeah, once you know, at at the end of the day, maybe you know, a lot of '80s movies are kind of ridiculous, kind of you know, get get very extra, and. Not to, to, you know, obviously, you know, some of the ones in the 90s were even even more ridiculous than that. But, yeah, this is the kind of thing that, you know, wouldn't have been made before the 80s. But, I think a... There's, a, there's some really great comedies in the 60s. You know, if, if this had been tried as one of them, but, it, you know, value-wise, it wouldn't have sided with the women. But, yeah, I I think the... there could have... that that could maybe have, have worked better. But, but, you know, again, to be sure, there are some really excellent 80s comedies. So, I am going to briefly talk about the, the opening of the movie is... Like, there are so many little snapshots of, you know, yeah, the, basically the very start is this shot of women's, you know, women marching to work. And it focuses on the, like, the, the feet and shoes, you know, because that is very gendered, like, there's a, there's an expectation for women when it comes to stuff like shoes, you know, appearance in general, that just is not, pl you know, placed on men. So, yeah, and and again, like it's the the way that it's shot and edited, it's not making fun of women for being in the workplace. It's basically, in you know, in part, it's telling us that this is a movie about women in the workplace, and the the pressures put on them that are not put on men. I'm not saying that no pressure is put on men in the workplace. I'm saying there are different pressures, and in a lot of ways, women have it worse, have have worse pressures put on them. And it's also asking us to empathize with women, you know. But yeah, there's there's so many great little details of the you know having to get up early and having to to go to work, you know, and the the various stresses, like one woman misses the bus, and, one, you know, one woman is calling for a taxi, and these various situations, and it's just, yeah, it, it's, 
immediately puts you in the mindset for the, the movie. The opening of a movie can be extremely important. And this one does an excellent job. And, it, you know, it absolutely does not hurt that it's set to the 9 to 5 song. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I think the ending is excellent. And, let's see. The... Yeah, I the, the movie doesn't really lose your interest along the way, though some parts might hit different than than others. And certainly, if you go into this not knowing that it's going to become this kind of sitcom, ridiculous kind of thing, you know, that, that might really come out of left field. And that brings us to the characters. So... Jane Fonda plays Judy Burnley, and she's a new employee, and basically, you know, the, the all three women work at Consolidated, and this is her first job after being a housewife. And, let's see, the, um, yeah, you know, the, the, Jane Fonda helped shape the movie as producer, and, Yes, obviously, it wasn't great that she had her picture taken on the Viet Cong anti-aircraft gun, but she has apologized for that, and perhaps equally importantly, explained it. And with that said, I love her politics. I think she's a very talented actress, like in China Syndrome. Um, yeah, I mentioned her politics before her talent as an actress, because I do think politics are more important, but yeah. I don't... This is the first comedy I've seen her in, I, I believe, and yeah, she really did a great job. Like, there's a... I've seen drama, dramatic actors who, you know, like, try comedy, and they're like... They they have... You, you can read on their face and in their eyes. They are terrified that this thing is going to ruin their reputation, that people won't take them seriously anymore... And, you know, I get that, uh, you know, it, I think more recently it's been more accepted that you can have comedy and also do something completely different, you know, there, there are uh, um, horror comedies these days that are very well received, people are more open to the idea that you can laugh and be scared in equal measure by the same film. You know, certainly, you know, a director like Jordan Peele has really helped that kind of thing along. And, and you know, personally, I would say stuff like Barbarian and Ready or Not, Fresh, you know, excellent. You know, they, they really do a great job of blending horror and really dark comedy. But with that said, a dramatic actor who's clearly not comfortable doing comedy that can really hurt the performance and the interplay with the other, you know, cast members and such. And that is absolutely not what happens. Like, if I hadn't, if I didn't know anything about Jane Fonda, if this was the first thing that I saw her in, I would have guessed that she was a comedian. I would not have picked up, oh, she's a dramatic actress and she's willing to do comedy. You know, basically, originally it was supposed to be, you know, they... they they considered they, they conceived it as a drama, but they ended up f figuring, well, you know, maybe some sugar will make the medicine go down easier, so let's make it a comedy. And, that, and, and certainly, you can easily see, you know, and I, w I would kind of like to see how the, the version of this that is just a drama, you know, because, yeah, like, if you remove the jokes, it's serious enough, like... You know, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, if you remove the... If, if you take Monty Python and you remove the jokes, you're not going to end up with drama. It's, you know, it's still going to be really absurd. You may be not laughing anymore, but you're not, like, dramatically engaged either. This, you could easily have made... And, and actually, yeah, I kind of... I, I admire that they managed to turn it into such an effective comedy. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, to... Prof 
prepare for her role as Judy Burnley, a middle-aged divorcee entering the workforce, Jane Fonda interviewed numerous women who had entered the workforce late in life due to divorce or widowhood and inspired Judy's first day outfit, a frilly conservative wardrobe with oversized glasses, elaborate hats, and an overdone hairstyle. And yeah, it really, like, there are some really great intro. I, I think... Every major character gets a really solid introduction here. That was something that, you know, I, I feel like today some movies just don't understand. I'm, I'm not saying all older movies are better than newer movies, but some movies today just do not appreciate how important an introduction is because they can really tell you how to feel about a character. You know, set up expectations which are then either met or subverted later. And, yeah, every major character in this gets such a spot-on performance. And, yeah, seeing her walk into, you know, the workplace like this, it really, like, she might as well just have, like, written on her forehead, I'm new here. Like, it, it's just, it's... If she were radioactive and, like, there was a, there was a, one of those, like you know, police lights on her head going off, she couldn't be more obviously... T like, she stands out like a sore thumb. And I, I appreciate, you know, it's uh, like... Again, you know, there's a lot of pressure put on women for their appearance, and she's willing to look ridiculous because it's funny, you know, and and real. And, and it is that thing of they manage to make it simultaneously funny... And we sympathize with her. And certainly there are characters in this that we laugh at that we never sympathize with. So they do understand that you can do both. You know, laughing at someone doesn't mean sympathizing with them, but it also doesn't mean not sympathizing with them. You can do both. And and it really, like, you, you see her and you're like, I, I really hope she makes, you know, she, look, look at, you know, that poor dear. You know, you, you really want to succeed and she also she struggles at the at the start because of the the you know yeah this this work and yeah you know you you really you really hope that she'll she'll pull through rise to the occasion now uh let's see yeah so uh critic quote throughout the late 1970s yeah Jane Fonda performed a remarkable feat of synthesizing her acting and her activism, serving as a producer, sometimes uncredited, the Vietnam vet drama Coming Home, the nuclear meltdown thriller The China Syndrome, and this comedy, which brought to light the gender in inequity plaguing America workplaces. At first glance, 9 to 5 might seem lightweight compared to its predecessors and Fonda's producing oeuvre, but treating the theme with humor provided a savvy move because it attracted a wide audience. The picture earned more than $100 million at the domestic off box office when, at a time when that was still a rare achievement, and now 9 to 5 is considered something of a modern classic. The picture even inspired a TV series, which ran sporadically from 1982 to 1988, as well as a 2009 Broadway musical. And, yes, so Lily Tomlin plays Violet Newstead, a widow with four kids who has been working at Consolidated for 12 years, despite being very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the company. Let's see. Yeah, Hart treats her like a secretary, and... Let's see. Yeah, she's the most senior supervisor on her floor and becomes responsible for training Judy, whom she eventually befriends. And that is yeah so yeah she really i i gotta see lily tomlin in more comedies because holy crap she was hilarious like every step of the way she knew exactly how to play it like early on you you know she's very overworked and and like trying to make sure that everything still goes well and then there are times where she like really relaxes and there are times where she's like in this really unusual situation trying to deal with it and she just she is spot on every step of the way like there are a lot of comedians who can't do all of those things well 
and it's like, oh, okay, now we're in the that part of the, okay, well, eventually they'll go to something we like better, and she just absolutely n nails it, you know. Yeah, as a, as a quick example, I'm not sure I've ever, I, I liked Jim Carrey's work a lot in the 90s. I could, st I could still sit down and watch Liar Liar and laugh my ass off. I, when he plays normal, it's just not particularly interesting. Like, we, we just, we want to see him go back to, to shtick and funny faces and, and, you know, doing weird things. So, yeah, you know, and, and Lily Tomlin, like, seeing her normal, I, yeah, it, it provided a really excellent contrast. And, and yeah, part of it is also, like, when you see Jim Carrey, like, you kind of get the sense that he's not that interested in playing normal, when he's doing comedies. I, I, th I think he's done excellent dramatic work as well. But when he's doing a comedy, he's clearly not that interested in the, the normal parts of the performance. He absolutely throws himself into the physicality and such. But he really doesn't want to be doing the, the you know, the, the normal thing. You can, you can tell he's like, okay, just... Suffer through it, you'll get to do ridiculous stuff soon. And Dolly Parton plays Doralee Rhodes, Frank Hart's attractive married secretary, who he consistently flirts with and sexually harasses. And let's see. Yeah, uh, I, I really did not know very much about her before I decided to watch this and do a vlog and then I did some research and now I'm kind of a fan of hers. Like, the only, I think the only thing I knew, you know, obviously I had heard this song before and I was like, it's great that there's someone, you know, spreading that message. And I heard Jolene, I'm, I don't think I even knew any other songs of hers. And of course I knew, you know, she has like a theme park, which is quite cool. But, yeah, she seems like a really great person. And, let's see. Yeah, so there's this, uh, you know, there's a, um, yeah, Hart spreads an untrue rumor that he and Doralee are having an affair, resulting in the staff shunning her. And through this, the film fights back against the stereotype that all secretaries are sleeping with their boss, and points out that rumors like that are frequently started by men who get off on the idea that they can seduce and dominate all women near them even when the women aren't interested. And in fact, there are a number of men who are threatened by the idea that a woman in their vicinity... That, that, that they couldn't, you know, maybe here is a woman that they couldn't actually, you know, makes them feel like less of an alpha, less of a, you know, they, they want to have all the, the women. And, and he knows that she's married. And it's, he actually, the fact that he's married and she's married makes him want the affair even more. You know, he it, it's like just this... Yeah, he, he feels like if there's an attractive woman near him, he should be able to seduce her. And just, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, because, the, yeah, you know, for a while it was just kind of assumed and a lot of, you know, it, it meant that a lot of women were hated for working, you know, near men. A lot of secretaries, like the, the stereotype goes that the wife hates the secretary because she assumes that the, you know, they're sleeping together. And here we have a secretary who's like 100% uninterested in, and, and she's, she expresses that very clearly and he doesn't accept it. And that's where, you know, so yeah, he's... He wants a he he ah, there we go. He wants an affair with a married woman. He you know he spreads the he spreads the rumor, and he does not accept that she doesn't want it because that's at the end of the day like whether you're a man woman non-binary any you know regardless of how you define yourself regardless of what gender or you know regardless of who you're attracted to. If you just approach someone and just express interest 
as long as you accept if they say no, that's fine. You know, and, and obviously, you know, try to gauge, you know, like if if you're seeing the person and they seem like upset or, or sad or, you know, if they seem like they don't really want to be approached by someone for romantic purposes, don't approach them. You know, try to try to read the room, try to read the situation. But beyond that, you know, so it's not about, you know, the, the, like, yeah, you know, years ago, I approached a woman that, you know, I was interested in, she expressed she wasn't interested, and we actually became friends afterwards, you know, because I wasn't being super possessive or, like, I, I accepted that it wasn't, you know, that she wasn't interested. And, you know, and I'm not saying that there's something wrong with approaching women. For some reason, there's some, you know, mis misogynists can't seem to grasp that there's, like, okay, so on the one hand, you have, like, you know, sexual harassment and, you know, rape and that kind of thing. On the other hand, you have, like, just completely, you know, not not even going near a woman, never expressing interest. And some misogynists don't seem to understand. There's a lot in... Uh, yeah, the hand thing is a bad metaphor. Anyway, these are the two extremes. There's a lot in between, you know, the, just because you move a little bit away from, just because you ex express a little bit of interest, that doesn't mean that you're, like, awful. Now, let's see, so, the, yeah, so, a critic quote about Dolly Parton. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, the, the movie, through Dolly Parton, you know, she contains so much energy, so much life, and unstudied natural exuberance that watching her do anything in this movie is a pleasure. And let's see. She, she hardly seems to access, exist as a sexual being in this movie. She exists on another plane, as Monroe did. She is a center of life on the screen. And Dabney Coleman plays Franklin Hart Jr., Vice President of Consolidated, the boss of Judy, Violet, Roz, and Doralee. And... Yeah, despite being married, he's not shy about flirting or sexually harassing other women, especially Doralee, and refers to the secretaries on his floor as his girls. And just, yeah. Yeah, a quick critic quote. Coleman is brilliant as Hart, making use of his hard features and clipped voice. He seems to relish playing a truly loathsome pig of a man. We love to hate him. And, like, I saw a... a um, interview with Dolly Parton where she said out of, you know, when he wasn't in character, when the camera was off, he was actually very nice and sweet and they had a very good relationship and that's important. You know, sometimes it can work extremely well if you have a protagonist and an antagonist who hate each other on and off screen. But a lot of times it works much better if you have, you know, yeah, if if you have a, a couple, a, a, a comedy coupling, where both character, bo both actors really respect the other and really love working with the other, because then they can, you know, they can basically, they can trust a lot in each other, and they can play things, you know, they can they can use each other's strengths, you know, that's that's a if you're doing comedy. And you're working with others. You know, obviously stand-up comedy is very different. But if you're doing comedy with other people as like as equal partners, I mean, not just working a crowd, which is very different, you really have to... It's much better if you respect and know the strengths and weaknesses of your partners. Because then you can really just... You know, you, you, can, you can... You don't have to verbally talk through every single little thing you can do something a little bit different and they'll pick up on it and react and you know it's for example the the 
despite how much their characters hate each other, Drew Carey, and I'm going to go ahead and find her name real quick, because it would feel disrespectful not to, on the Drew Carey show, Drew Carey playing himself and Kathy Kinney playing Mimi Bobek. Their characters despise each other, and that's not a spoiler, because they're both in the pilot, and they are just clearly, they can't stand each other. In real life, they actually like each other, or at least did when the show was on. I, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but yeah, they... And because they are so comfortable around each other, they can, they can push the shtick very far. Like, they're, they're able to get very ridiculous, you know, and, yeah, the, the, and, and other than them, then you have the British comedy Allo Allo, which ran 1982 to 1992, but because it's British, only has 85 episodes, but yeah, it's, it's great. I, I really, really love that show, and, Re uh, jo Gordon Kay, who plays René Artois, and Carmen Silvera, who played Edith Artois. Uh, actually, yeah, um, I believe they are now. Yeah, um, R.I.P. To, to both of them. They have sadly passed. They Their characters, you know, argue a lot. And certainly René really, really hates... Uh, I can't believe I already forgot her name. Edith. But the actual actors really, really held each other in very high regard. And he was actually, he was devastated when she died. And, yeah, you know, because of this, they were able to, to push a lot of things much further than, you know, because at the end of the day, like, if you have two comedians who hate each other, if one of them, you know, a, a lot of this comedy is derived from... Going into like the 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 uh, character flaws and such, and a lot of them, a lot of those character flaws start out as you know stuff about the actor. Like certainly, if you have a comedian who has a, sp a very specific appearance, a lot of the comedy at their expense is gonna be about the appearance stuff. And if you have two two actors. Two comedic actors who hate each other and are kind of, you know, maybe they are a little self-conscious about the, the traits about them that make for a lot of comedy. Yeah, if they're constantly dealing with this other comedian who's making fun of stuff that they're already self-conscious about, they're going to really hate it, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's frequently better when they they really get along and you you can tell you can tell that Dolly Parton and Dabney Coleman got along cuz they really they get such great material out of each other such great performances uh, you know m most of the material was probably in the script but yeah the the you know she really she's frustrated with him and he is very attracted to her so that, that's, you know, there's some great energy there. She really, really hates. You know, the, the more obvious he gets in objectifying her, the more frustrated she becomes. So, so you have something great to, there that you can just build on and, and let unravel. And it absolutely, it, they, they, it's, it works incredibly well. It's, it's. Yeah, and they do a really great job, like, at no point do you wonder if maybe is she into it, or is he maybe not that bad of a guy? No, there there is not a single frame of this where it feels like, oh, maybe she's a little, in no, no, she isn't, 100%, and it's, like, it's plain on her face, like, you can tell, like, when he says something, like, she, she, He's the boss, and she needs this job, so she can't, like, tell him off all the time. 
but like the the look on her face when when she realized oh he made another oh, you know just like she really hates it there's there's absolutely no doubt now let's see. and and you know again it's completely clear that he does know that she's married you know so he like he doesn't mind the idea of ruining someone else's marriage and you know like as i always say if you if you are with someone if you have a monogamous relationship with someone that both of you agreed is supposed to be monogamous you know it's it's a different matter if you talk about an open relationship you know obviously don't push that kind of thing on someone but if you know there are people who can live with that that's fine there's absolute there's nothing an open relationship isn't inherently worse than a monogamous monogamous one it's it's just about managing expectations and accepting boundaries and respectful open communication but if you have a monogamous relationship and you just you know for whatever reason you aren't interested in your partner anymore don't cheat end the relationship you know there's there's no good reason to cheat not everybody who cheats is a bad person sometimes you know like obviously if there there are some circumstances but the vast majority of the time just you know certainly if you feel attracted to someone else if you legitimately feel like okay i would rather sleep with that person than be monogamous you know i mean you can start the conversation by saying should we try an open relationship but if they're not interested in that then end the relationship before you go on to to someone else right i i so let's see i mentioned the introduction of judy yes briefly lily is introduced clearly like working hard and she's really got things under control she knows what she has to do she, you know and you know not being appreciated by heart and dolly is introduced as unpopular with the others and she doesn't you know it's it's clear that she doesn't herself quite understand why she doesn't know about the rumor and which is also a great like anti gossip like if you think that's you know someone is doing something that they shouldn't it, but if you only heard gossip you haven't like seen evidence or something maybe talk to them and ask wait is is it true what they're saying or is that just you know and let's see and and you know yeah dolly is also introduced clearly unappreciated by heart and heart is introduced just really being it's just really unpleasant to the people that he you know that that work for him and clearly taking advantage and let's see so i guess yeah i want to talk about that character but i don't really want to do that before the so i'll put it here at the end in the spoiler section I'll get into. So, Elizabeth Wilson plays Roz, Hart's sycophantic, loyal administrative assistant who constantly eavesdrops on the other staff. That's not a spoiler. It's it's set up very early on and she's also introduced like just let's see. Yeah, in her introduction she literally like directly quotes the the something Hart said and she's quoting it to Violet and Violet, like, immediately picks up, of course she's going to say it, you know. And she says it as the, you know, just to really hammer home, I know, Roz, I know that that's what Mr. Hart thinks because he says it all the time. You don't have to say what he said because we all heard it before. You're at a 10. You need to be at a 2. Calm down, you know, and, and that's really great. And... Yeah, you know, sadly, it is true, you know, some women, I, I take no, you know, pleasure in saying this, but there are, unfortunately, women who work against other women, you know, and 
yeah, again, like, I can't say for sure, but I feel like that was probably the addition of... It's right here. Patricia Resnick realizing that, you know, it is necessary for all women to stand together. It's not enough for a few really competent women, you know, and, and like, more recently we've had the whole girl boss thing, which, you know, it, it appeared to be a, a feminist thing, but then, you know, it, it, we start realizing, wait, no, it's just, it's just women, it's just in, a few individual women who have a lot of power, they're still treating the women working for them badly, you know, it's not automatically good, you know, if, if the, if the woman at the top is going to behave like the man at the top, then that's not the solution to the problem of women being, you know, treated badly by men who have more heart, oh, ha. more power than them. There we go. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's, yeah, don't, don't talk and read at the same time or you'll accidentally mix up words. Now, let's see. The, um, yeah, um, yeah, Henry Jones as Hinkle, he's Consolidated's president, and Lawrence Pressman, considering that term, I should probably call him Richard. He is Judy's ex-husband, and he's also, like, wow, they, they really, yeah, they, they make him really exhibit some incredibly awful behavior to criticize not all men, not every single, but men who behave in that particular way. I, I don't know why misogynists have such a difficult time understanding that distinction. You know, what I always say is, if you think that one movie where there are prominent male characters who do really awful things is saying that all men are awful, does that mean that all the male-centric movies that have prominent women who behave badly is saying all women are bad? Because there's way more of those than there are of female-centric movies that criticize toxic masculinity. But And, and to be clear, I'm not saying all male-centric movies are misogynist, but a huge amount of them are. You know, for a long time, misogyny was just the norm. Ren Woods plays Barbara, one of Judy and Violet's co-workers. Norma Donaldson plays Betty, another co-worker. Roxana Bonilla Giannini plays Maria, a co-worker who Judy befriends. Let's see. And Peggy Pope plays Margaret. And Richard Stahl plays Mead. Ray Vitte as Eddie. And yeah. That brings us to. So, yes. Um, I would really like for there to be more the uh, um, ethnic diversity. And I realize back then there probably wouldn't have been very much LGBTQ diversity but the movie does make it clear that the you know there are black people working at this company and they're also getting overlooked because they're not white men you know and and that's also something like if they made a new version today I think it would be great if I, I think it's great to still center it on three women. I think maybe if one of the women wasn't white and maybe one of the women was openly not straight, possibly even trans, you know, that kind of thing would be really great for representation and could really allow, you know, communicating about. Because there, there are issues that they face that white women don't face. But... 
the movie is about these three white women and you know who work very hard in this office and it is actually interested in their perspectives their the problems they face that the men don't now you know because at the end of the day like it's great to have diversity just in general it's a lot better if the diversity is what's the word um if the movie is if the piece of media is trying to understand their perspective rather than just putting someone there that you know cause that's that's one of the I don't have a lot of criticisms of fresh but I did you know I I wanted to you know quote uh, you know another critic pointed out we really don't know very much about the black bisexual best friend character and it kind of feels like she's just there to to you know have a little more diversity because really that movie could easily have starred a black bisexual woman you know but yeah so anyway yeah the the dialogue is great there's a lot of lines where like you can understand why they can get away with saying what they're saying, but what they're saying is clearly an insult to the other person. And the the other person is so so certain that they're popular that it's it flies completely over their head. They're not quick enough. They don't have quick enough reflexes to catch it. And just the yeah, there's some some really great stuff. I I really appreciate like the movie never makes the women like. It does, the, the women aren't, like, perfect, but they're never made to seem lesser than men because of specifically feminine traits, which I, I really, really appreciate. There, you know, sometimes you'll have a piece of progressive, a, a piece of media that appears to have progressive values, but then they'll do a little wink and nod and like, oh, don't worry, we're, you know, we're not that progressive, we can still make fun of you know personally i think i think there are very few things that should be completely off um that that you can't joke about you know i love jojo rabbit i love the producers uh, the original one i haven't watched the the more recent ones you know i'm a big fan of jimmy carr i think you can make fun of pretty much anything what matters most is how you do it if you're if you're making fun of something that's a you know where where based on what you're making fun of there's some chance that it could spread hatred then it's extremely important that you're doing it in a way that makes it clear that you would be against that hatred you know it let, make the joke so that if someone who does hate that minority hears it you know, maybe maybe for a second they think, ah, yeah, you're you're on my side, and then when they stop and think about the punchline, they realize they're the ones being made fun of, not the minority. And yeah, the, the you know this one, there are women's issues in it, and there is comedy, but it never says that women's issues are less important or that women are somehow inherently ridiculous, which a lot of comedy that focuses a lot on women, especially when it's made by misogynists, yeah, they, they will just try to make out, like, the, the, the women themselves are, you know, that, that there's something inherently wrong or lesser about women. I, I remember years ago, there's this Danish stand-up comedian who made this really, really sexist... I wouldn't quite say the joke itself was misogynist, although other times he has expressed misogyny, where he would basically... He, he made this really sexist remark about... And, and, you know, yeah, basically said all women, X, Y, Z. And one woman in the audience, you know, she wasn't, like, standing up. She wasn't, like, loud, but she just, like... Uh, I think she basically just said, no, that's not true, or some, something like that. And instead of, like, it didn't seem to inspire any introspection, at least not at the moment, possibly since. 
But he just said, yeah, yeah, it is. Instead of saying, okay, fine, you're, you're right. Here's the, this is the kind of woman that I'm talking about, you know. A lot of male comedians just don't have empathy for women, and it's a problem. That brings us to the cinematography by Reynaldo Villalobos. He has 68 credits as cinematographer. He is still working today, so that's very cool. Uh, he, yeah, he was cinematographer on something called Crooked Halos that came out last year. Now, I'm not really familiar with the rest of his work. Oh, uh, he did some Breaking Bad. Uh, I watched the first season of Breaking Bad. I, I'm not currently planning on watching the rest, but certainly that is a very well shot show. He was DOP on, a DP on Not Another Teen Movie, which, not a great movie, but it is well shot. If you just look at, you know, if you mute so you don't hear some of the worst jokes. It is, like, he appreciates, it's it's shot in part like a teen comedy, and that's important for parody, is mimicking the style. Because if, you, if you're just going for a completely different style, the parody isn't going to land as well. It just feels too removed from what it's making fun of. Now, let's see, yeah, I'm, oh! Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, which, yeah, that one's, that one's also fun and definitely very well shot. A Bronx Tale, which I actually do have on the, I, I intend to be, to, to do a vlog on that one as well. Very well shot. And, let's see, I think think that might be oh some LA law Alfred Hitchcock presents now I think that might be about what I know but but yeah the the movie is well shot the the there are a couple of parts where like they'll they'll montage their way through something and yeah you know, if you're doing a montage, the filming and the editing of that is extremely important. Like, if you if you don't get that right, it's just not going to work. You know, if you've never sat... You know, it's it's worth just, like... You know, if, if you're interested in editing and cinematography, sit down and, like, watch a, a montage, watch it multiple times, go shot by shot, and notice how... Because... A montage has to have progression. If you don't have progression, it's just not going to work. And you see, I'm, I'm not sure there's any major movie that completely gets it wrong, but some of the stuff that, like, MST3K would show, some of those movies just didn't really understand that you can't, you can't shoot a montage as if you're shooting a scene. That's just not going to work. You know, there, there has to be a certain energy and focus in, in a montage where a scene you can a scene should have breathing room a montage it's kind of it's a it's a tunnel you just you you it, it has to it has to move through it other if, if the if the montage is standing still then that has to be for like a comedic effect maybe but otherwise a montage has to keep moving or it's just, you know, a, um, a montage that's kind of start-stop, unless it's for comedic effect, that's really going to kill the pacing. So, now, and that brings us to the editing by Pembroke J. Herring, R.I.P. He edited, he, he has 33 credits as editor, and the most recent thing he did was Multiplicity in 1996. I'm not sure. I'm very familiar. Oh, he edited Groundhog Day. That's a very well edited. You know, not a huge fan of the movie. It's very well edited. And that's also where montage, you know, if that movie's montages didn't work, that movie would fall apart. So, and that's another, you know, other than the shooting, the edit, I think I already said that. Yeah, the editing is extremely important in a montage. And other than that, just for the movie in general, the way you film and edit a comedy 
is really, really important. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard there's a, I forget, I think it might be um, Obscure's Lupa who says that the most painful kind of movie to watch is, oh, hold on. That actually, yeah, I, I forgot that I, I, yes, this editor worked on all three of the, of Colin Higgins, the, the movies that Colin Higgins directed. So they must have really had a good working relationship, and that really shows. You know, if, if, the, if the director and editor are not friends, that's not, that is really going to hurt the movie. You know, I, I, I'm, I'll try to think of, uh, if I think of an example, I'll put it in the description box, but I'm, I'm not sure I can think of anything, like, off the top of my head, but I guess I could quickly... Uh, let's see. Um... Yeah, I'm not offhand seeing. I, I tried Googling it. Um, yeah. Anyway, if if they really disagree, that's gonna... You know, if they're pulling in different directions, that's really gonna hurt it. So, yeah, actually, yeah, a, a quick example, uh, not, not of, of disagreement in the movie Godsend from 2004... Um, Robert De Niro is not the star and really wishes that the the film didn't act like he was because he was never intending to be the star. Anyway, the that movie, the, the writer and director disagree vehemently on the ending. And it shows. Like, you watch that movie and it's like, that's, that's the ending? Really? You know, and the DVD has alternate versions... And I, th I think there's maybe three or four alternate endings. One of them is the favorite of the director. One of them is the favorite of the writer. And they're almost like bickering on the commentary track for it. And it's like, why did you make an entire movie together if you can't agree on some... Like, the ending of a movie is extremely important. And they, they completely disagreed. And that movie is worse for the writer and the director having completely different opinions of what the movie is supposed to be like. And this is the kind of thing you're supposed to figure out before you start production. This is a pre-production issue. You know, the moment that the director reads the script, you know, like, ideally the script tells him what the screenwriter thinks the movie should be, and then if he disagrees with it, he can maybe talk to the screenwriter and they can see if they can come to an agreement, or if maybe the screenwriter wants to just leave the project and ha you know the director has it rewritten or something. But no, they worked the entire movie together, never agreeing. Anyway, but yes, the... Obscure's Lupa says that the the most painful movie to watch is a failed comedy, a movie that means to be funny and simply isn't. And editing is a huge part of that because you are editing to make it as funny as possible. You know, you 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 want the editing to support, not to not not work against the laughs. And this is a movie where that is 100%, like, yeah, the, the, he really understood the, the, he got the jokes and he knew how to make them work with the editing. Cause there's a lot, like, I, I, um, I think I'll talk about some of the examples, but there are multiple in, in the spoiler section, but there are multiple smash cut jokes in this where a character will say a line and it'll smash cut to something and the, the thing it cuts to is the punchline. You know, the line said is the setup, or part of the setup at least, and the punchline, you know, it might not be the first part of the setup, it might be the last part of the setup, and smash cut, and the, the thing it cuts to, that's the laugh line, that's the, that's the thing you laugh at. If the editor did not understand the joke, you know, if he, if he leaves a little breathing room after the line, before the, the cut, or if he cuts to something that isn't that doesn't work as the punchline, you know that's it's yeah 
you know, Obscure's Lupa has a good point. That can be painful to watch, you know, especially if it happens over and over in a movie. But, yeah, because, like, if a movie is really, really funny all the way through, you're, you're laughing over and over, that works and that can build nicely. If there's at least one joke that just does not work, where people are just like, oh, well, that wasn't funny, that's really going to kill the momentum. You can... You know, if you're very talented, you can maybe get the momentum going again. But ideally, you get the momentum going early and you keep it moving throughout. I would say that is the case here. You know, at most, I, I and I'm not saying that if you disagree, you're automatically wrong. But I would argue that the biggest thing is that maybe you're not going to follow the movie when it starts to get more ridiculous because it starts so down to earth, fairly literally, like I said. it One of the first things you see, it, actually, yeah, before you see them walking on the street, you see them hitting the alarm clock in the morning. But yeah, you know, very early on you see this shot of all these women walking, you know, through the city to get to work. And... Yeah, later on, it's it gets very ridiculous, and maybe you you can't not not through a failing, but maybe maybe you don't follow. Maybe maybe you feel like it's too big. There's too much of a contrast there for it to to work. I can only speak for myself and other fans. Yeah, we really really loved it. You know, it it just it's difficult to do a, a comedy that does that never gets kind of ridiculous. <sighs> yeah, a anyway. That brings us... So, so yes, the, the budget was $10 million and the box office was 103.3. So that's, that's a very significant, you know, and, and this is for, you know, so, so yeah, it's, it's female-led, it's progressive, it's, about you know it's it's not quite critical of capitalism but it is critical of the kind of nine to five the grind you know which you know a lot of people will tell you you can't you can't joke about stuff that's boring in real life you just can't and in real life nine to five work is not funny you know it's not funny to do it then you have the the fact that it's you know you have like, Jane Fonda wasn't thought of as a comedian. Dolly Parton wasn't thought of as, you know, a movie movie personality at all. She was she was purely a singer at this point in her career. Popular. You know, I, I believe she, she drew in a lot of people. You know, had been a singer for a while. Was thought of as a singer. Like, we have a lot of cases of musicians who are not, who just can't transition into movies you know so yeah these are th at least five reasons why like by the conventional wisdom this movie would have done very poorly you know the the wisdom says that oh you gotta have male leads otherwise people aren't gonna watch ah progressivism people don't like being preached to you know you have these things so so just yeah and and yeah it, the movie really really works it's no wonder that it did so well. Now, this was filmed on location, various parts of California, and they get a lot out of, like, it has a very, it, it feels like this is where this kind of stuff actually happens, when, you know, and, and some of it, they did actually film where stuff happened, you know, the, the, the bus, the, the person missing, the, the woman missing the bus, and the woman calling for a taxi and that. That's shot on the street with, you know. But the moment that you have this, like, you're if you're filming a comedy on a set, like, you're not having people do normal work there. That's just not a thing that's happening. Like, if you're doing a drama and a character goes to prison for a while, sometimes that can be filmed in a prison with prisoners as extras. But you cannot do a comedy next to office workers doing serious work. That's not a thing that happens. Like, they they would, you know, yeah, the 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 comedy cast and crew would constantly be worried about can they can they focus while we're making all this noise and running around and all this stuff, you know? 
so so yeah that's let's see and the yes so charles fox composed for this movie and 135 total and he actually composed for a movie that came out just last year although there was a gap between 2022 and 2010 but yeah you know he does still do some let's see and yeah i gotta say i do not really recognize a lot of this other stuff oh uh the odd couple together again so that's almost definitely also a comedy certainly the original odd couple is um let's see yeah it it seems like he has done ah uh, the gods must be crazy to tarzan in manhattan yeah he's done other comedies and that's also, like, comedy music is difficult. Honestly, comedy is one of the, the toughest genres. If something is off, it just doesn't work. And obviously, there's some truth in that for every genre. But if you have a comedy and, like, for example, you know, like I mentioned, some of the later stuff in the movie gets kind of ridiculous. If the music is trying to play it as more, like, down-to-earth. You know, there's going to be a, a really uncomfortable contrast there. And on the other hand, if the, mu is the, if the music is, like, huge and, and ridiculous from right away, then the down-to-earth stuff doesn't work. So, yeah, he did a really excellent job here. And... 254 soundtrack credits, so, yeah. Now, the... Let's see. Yes, um, Jane Fonda, I, I watched a, an interview uh, with her that where, where she said of the humor in this movie, nothing is funny that isn't controversial. And, yeah, that is very true. And, yeah, they, they do a really, really great job. You know, like I said, the, the the jokes are at the expense of toxic males, not at the women. And... Yeah, the, the pacing is perhaps a bit uneven. There, there are parts of it that, like, are, are very, you know, fast-paced and, and, you know, a lot, st a lot happens in a very short amount of time. And then there are other parts where it is a bit more relaxed. Personally, I've, I felt that it worked, but I can, I can definitely see some people would feel like it just, yeah, you know. Um, right, so I haven't yet, but I guess I could very quickly see if I can pinpoint a good when how how much of this movie should people watch in order to feel like they've given it a chance and if they don't like what they've seen up to that point i would maybe say watch up until about 48 minutes but if you if if that's more than Or, at, yeah, at the very least, give it to about 33 minutes. If nothing has happened by then that you're interested in seeing play out, and, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a perfectly fine place to, to stop. If, if you're really not liking it. So, the best element, I gotta say, it's, it's probably a tie between the progressive values, the three stars... And just, yeah, some of, some of the material is just absolute gold. I'll, I'll try to t talk about what I mean in, in the spoiler sections, because just I am not going to give them away for people who haven't already watched the, the movie. <sighs> yeah, the, the worst aspect is probably the... Yeah, ultimately, 
my personal biggest issue is that I, I really wish there was at least a little bit more diversity. And, you know, I'm, I'm not... I'm not a woman, so I can't speak to, but I've heard female feminists say that white feminism, you know, ha has an issue with focusing too much on white women because certain, you know, the, the thing is, even white women, a lot of them have been conditioned by culture here in the West to think of themselves as above black women. So you know sometimes of you know of um a white woman will realize that you know white white women have problems but they they struggle to include others and and yeah so that is that is is my personal biggest issue with it ultimately it's not something that like ruins the movie it's the kind of thing that i would really love to see them try to address in um you know if if they make a either a, a sequel or um if if just maybe if they produce if the three women together produced and cameoed in a spiritual successor or something but yeah yeah, so the worst thing, according to others, is that it's uneven, and I can see what they mean. I don't personally think it's a big deal, but for sure, like, if it's the kind of thing that you might, that, that you think might bother you, the th it really might bother you. Uh, the thing I was most worried about was that maybe it would be, like, kind of petty about the, you know, because, for sure, huge problems faced by these women but sometimes when you you know especially american media can get kind of petty when it it's trying to to address grievances and yeah uh the the movie exceeded my expectations the the movie the, it's really not petty and yeah the thing i was most looking forward to was a piece of 80s progressive media and the movie exceeded my expectations it was I really, really loved watching this. I just realized I completely forgot to mention... No, no, wait, yeah. I mentioned at the start of the video that it is on Disney Plus right now, in Europe, at least. I could not... I, I don't know about America. Now, the trailers do give too much away. Um, they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And let's see, the the covers and posters don't give too... Actually, hold on. Yeah, yeah, maybe a little too much away. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I, I did not find a lot of other, you know... Here on YouTube, I found five clips, three trailers, including fan ones... Two TV spots, five tributes, six review analysis, two documentaries, six reactions, and a partridge in a pear tree. So this is not this has not been covered that much. And yeah, I I hope this video can help people, you know, remember how how good this is and new people see it. I, I am linking one uh what's it called? Um reaction video in the description box oh that's right i did yeah i ended up with no less than four links three of them youtube links that will go in the description box and yeah one of them is a reaction which yeah you know, really helps show how how much you can still laugh at it, and it's a fellow millennial watching it. So you know, this is not a movie that can't escape its decade and attract new viewers. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has an eighty-two percent, based on forty-five reviews and a seventy-four percent audience score. So, again, you know that. Let's see, Rotten Tomatoes. How old is that website in total? Let's see. Um, 
Rotten Tomatoes. I am struggling to find the um Okay, but certainly the, let's see, the internet is, what, uh, less than 20, ah, uh, less than 30 years old. So, yeah, you know, for sure, like, people didn't, you know, not not all 74, not, not all of the people who went and voted for this did so, you know, because they really remembered it from the 80s, because, the, you know, they wouldn't be able to vote on this movie on the internet for at least maybe 15 years so that's that's a long time to remember and I, I can I can see remembering this for that long but no a, a chunk of people who really love this movie clearly watch it much more recently so let's see and the yeah the audience score is based on over 25,000 ratings so a lot of people really love this and yeah, so the consensus is it might not be much of a way to make a living, but 9 to 5 is a wonderfully cast comedy that makes some sharp points about gender roles in the workplace. And yeah, so the 82%, the, the 45 reviews, 37 of them are fresh, only 8 are rotten, and the average rating is 7.10 out of 10, and the average user rating is 3.8 out of 5. Anything above a 3.5 is an upvote. And, yeah, that means it is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. And on Metacritic, it only has a 58 out of 100 based on 12 critic reviews, but the user score is 6.9. Let's see. And, the uh, yeah, of the, of the 12 critic reviews, six of them are positive, Five are mixed. There's only one negative review. And of the... Yeah, the, the 6.9 is based on 17 ratings, 13 positive, 2 mixed, only 2 negative. And on IMDb, there are 127 user reviews and 102 without spoilers. I went ahead and read all of them. Normally, I only read the top voted 100, but when there's that few, and yeah, this was yeah, this was another movie where I I knew a lot of spoilers going in. This is it's kind of difficult to avoid. You know the the it. I've known this movie existed, and at least some major aspects of it. I'd say probably at least 20 years, possibly more than that. You know, it it's the kind of movie once you, you know when you when you talk about it with other people who've watched it, you're not going to be talking about you know. So I've yeah I've I've heard and read you know other people's discussions of this movie bef long before I watched it. I knew a lot of the the punchlines, the plot developments, all these kinds of things, and I still really love watching it. You know, there are some movies that cannot. Um, survive prior knowledge where if you if you know what you're you know if you know the the things that are going to happen it's just not going to work this is not that now of the top 100 if there are zero one out of ten zero two out of tens and three out of tens there's one four out of ten eight five out of tens thirteen six ten seven sixteen eight 14, 9, and 30, 10 out of 10. So, yeah, this is a very popular movie. And let's see. So the... Huh. I, did I forget that? I will fix that very quickly. Oh, it's because of the... Okay, yeah. That is not something I can do anything about. Anyway, so... Yeah, on IMDb, it has a 6.9 out of 10 based on 35,272 IMDb users. So there are, yeah, 27.8% gave it a 7. That makes a lot of sense. 19.7 gave it a 6. 18.3 gave it 8. 11% gave it 10. 8.6% only gave it 5. 
that is the lowest I could really see giving it. And anything lower than that kind of feels to me like you just... You're not really taking it on its own terms. But, you know, that's just my opinion. You're free to disagree. 7.9 gave it 9 yeah, very few gave it less than, than 5. Uh, 3.4 gave it 4. 1.5 gave it 3. 1.2 gave it 1. And 0 0.7 gave it 2. There we go. And it won 4 awards and was nominated for 8. Yeah, the, you know, it, uh, let's see. It was nominated for the Oscar for Best Music Original Song for 9 to 5. No surprise there. And let's see. the Yeah, it was nominated for Golden Globes. Dolly Parton for the Best Actress in a Motion Picture Comedy or Musical. New Star of the Year in a Motion Picture Female. Best Original Song for 9 to 5. And it won, oh, she won a Grammy for Best Country Song. That makes a lot of sense. And also Best Country Vocal Performance. Let's see. Um, yeah, it was also nominated for Best Album of Original Score Written for a Motion Picture or Television Special, but not win. It won the... Online Film and Television Association of 2021 for, the, yeah, the Hall of Fame song, 9 to 5. The People's Choice Awards in 81. Favorite theme or song from a motion picture for the song, 9 to 5. And it was nominated by the Writers Guild of America. Uh, yeah, WGA Award for Best Comedy Written Directly for the Screen and yeah colin higgins and patricia resnick were nominated but did not win uh yeah so the there's not a lot of spe special effects but the ones there are are really really good i cannot give away any of the special effects without giving away some of the the, the j jokes that they use but um, rest assured, if you see a scene in this startup one way and you think you're going to see a certain kind of special effect, it's going to be good. And there are also some really, really solid stunts, which always fun to have those in a comedy. The, yeah, it, it's, you know, physical comedy can work extremely well and it does here. Now, um, there are no special features for this on um, at least the Western European Disney Plus. And let's see. Yeah, so my personal rating. Is it a nine? Is it a five? I, uh, I don't think I can quite give it a 9 out of 10. Nah, to, to be perfectly honest, it's probably more of a, a 5 out of 5. And yeah, so for reasons I've, t uh, you know, yeah, for reasons I've gone into throughout this video, I do think this movie holds up. And it is, I, I think, you know, there, there are some aspects of it that are, uh, you know, that have dated poorly. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the race and LGBTQ aspects. But this thing of, you know, women getting more respect from men, you know, sadly right now you have all these movements that, you know, where men... Uh, where misogynists are trying to say that they should have more power because men used to have all the power and now, you know, like I, I, years ago, 
I found myself frustrated that I did not have the life that I felt like media had basically promised me. And I think there was a while where I felt like, you know, like it meant that I hadn't gotten what I, you know, felt like I deserved. But then I did some more research and I realized I really am not that much of a victim. There, there are people who have much bigger problems than I. And the fact that media has promised me something that I then didn't get, that's not... That doesn't mean that women have done something wrong. It means, like, I, I do think we should try to adjust media and try to try to encourage more healthy expectations, you know, for for men, for for you know, basically everyone. And yeah, you know, I'm a lot happier now that I'm trying to focus on helping people who need help instead of just selfishly trying to, you know. I'm, I have had a lot of good fortune in, in life. I'm, I'm extremely lucky about where I was born, when I was born, to whom I was born. Like, you know, my parents aren't perfect, but they tried. And a lot of people, their parents weren't really, yeah, so, so. You know, that's that's the thing. If if you're watching this video and you're seething with rage, you're a misogynist and you feel like you've been really under attack in, in this video and by this movie. There's a there's a really excellent quote in the I can't believe I'm blanking on the American History X is what it's called. There's a there's a line by I'm blanking on the actor name, but it's right around here. Avery Brooks. And if you know anything about Avery Brooks, you know that when he speaks, you know, you, you listen. He's, he asks a white supremacist, has any choice you've made in your life, has any choice you've made improved your life? It's, it's something like that. It might not be verbatim. That's the thing I would want you to ponder if you feel like this movie is out to get you. You know, try to try to think about... Because feminists, you know, female, male, we do want a better world for, for everyone, not just for women. You know, it seems like misogynists believe that what feminists want is just to reverse it to where women have it as good as men have had it, you know, it's, it, yeah, by and large. Again, I'm not saying every man has it better than every woman. Just by and large. And that the, the yeah, you know, ba basically swapping out so that women have it as good as men have had it and men have it as bad as women have it. That's not the case. You know, I... Yeah, it's just a, it's a misunderstanding of feminism, and this misunderstanding is spread by grifters, misogynists who know that they themselves would, you know, they're they're they figure they can make more money and get more respect if they keep things as bad as they are for minorities, instead of trying to help minorities because you know some men just if they don't feel like they're above non-whites if they don't feel, a lot of white men if if they don't feel like they're above white non-whites if they don't feel like they're above women you know or, or lgbtq then they feel like they're nothing and that's really not that's I mean that's not that's just not healthy. Like you should you should try to build yourself you know it's not like like I mentioned I consider myself fortunate for what I was born into. What I you know 
And and at that point, I can choose to either throw it away or try to to use what I have to help others. You know, as a quick example, I know a lot of people who have strong opinions that you know, I've I've you know, I've I've told them you should you should be on YouTube, you know, you should you should go online and and help spread. And they're they're way too camera shy. You know, where I I was encouraged to, to yeah. So so the if you are a man, you have at least some male privilege, and if you check that privilege, if you try to make yourself, you know, build a strong identity, not around stuff you had no control over, like how you were born, but things you do. Now, let's see, that brings us to the thoughts section. So, starting with notes. So, spoilers from here on out. Notes taken while watching. And as per usual for recently, they are on paper. So, let's see. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, this is a movie that does a lot of great setup and payoff. Brazil is mentioned very early on, like maybe in the first five minutes or something. Like, you know, they, they, yeah, Violet, and that's also, it's a clever device. Judy enters the workforce. She, she needs orientation. The stuff Violet tells her is also important for us to hear. You know, you, you could, like, if you didn't have her character, how would you get this information across to the audience? Because it is very important. You know, we're told about Mr. Hart. We're told about Roz. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, unfortunately, the, the, you know, the rumor about Hart and Doralee is, is spread. And unfortunately, you know, at first, Julie does believe it. Ju Judy does believe it, you know, but yeah, you're, you're told all these things and yeah, one of them is, yeah, the, the boss man spends most of his time in Brazil and then, you know, by the ending, he's back from Brazil and he, you know, he says Mr. Hart has to come to Brazil now. So yeah, it's, it's a really great, yeah, because like I, I knew I had heard that that was going to be the ending. You know, he goes to Brazil. I, I didn't realize it was mentioned that early on. And it is this thing, because, like, then, you know, if you watch it and you didn't hear any spoilers, the moment that it's mentioned that, you know, oh, he's back from Brazil. I want you to come to Brazil, says the colonel, to teach him about the 11 herbs and spices, which are apparently the six Spice Girls and five guys named Herb, according to Twitter. The, the, you know, yeah, it's like, oh, right, Brazil, that was mentioned at the, you know, and at the start, it's like, oh, wow, he never checks up on stuff, does he? And then at the end, it's like, oh, you are going to go all the way, of, you know, and, and earlier he was like, he didn't want to spend, what was it, four weeks on, uh, on, a, on a boat, and now he's going to, what was it, like, years, although, yeah, then there's the thing with the Amazons, but, yeah. Let's see, and, um, yeah, and, and, you know, at first, Doralee forgives the things that Hart says because she needs the, the job, and later on, you know, it's, it's very satisfying, and, and I, it wouldn't have been if they didn't let him be, you know, like, he spends maybe the first 20 or 30 minutes with a lot of power, and really, the rest of the movie, he has almost none. That could easily, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, these women do spend a lot of the movie with more power than him. You know, they've, they've kidnapped him. And I do, you know, I, it feels almost silly to say, but they do try to make it humane for him. He still has his cigars. You know, he, like, they could have, they could have done much, much worse to him, you know. And... Yeah, you know, so so it's important that the movie makes sure that we hate him, and no matter what's done to him, we think it's funny, 
it's and it's deserved and we empathize with them so that you know i mean violet steals a body that she didn't mean to she didn't mean to steal the wrong body i mean she does end up stealing a body and like think about it if that is where the movie loses the audience if once you realize that's the wrong body in the trunk if you spend the rest of the movie hating violet's guts the movie's not going to work, you know. So, yeah. And I really appreciate that a lot of... Yeah, maybe everything that Hart says very early on is disproven, you know. He claims he's all about teamwork, but he steals other people's ideas. That's not... T that's that's literally the opposite of teamwork. He calls Doralee a dumb secretary. She shows that she is very smart. She, uh, yeah, he calls Judy uh, a moron, again, proven to not, yeah, you know, the Xerox machine scene, they they did a, a good job, again, like, if you're interested in editing, look at the editing of the scene, because, you know, at first it's just, you know, Violet goes in and says, oh, it sure is loud in here, okay, so press that button, read that thing, you know, it sounds simple, you know, when she says it, like, before the scene, at, at the start of the scene, you almost find yourself thinking, wow, I guess Xerox machines weren't that complicated back then. I, I could I could probably do that. And then she, you know, it goes completely wrong. It starts, like, spitting out paper, like, and, and some of the paper goes into the wrong thing and then f falls out. And she accidentally knocks over the, what was it, like, the trash can, I think. And, you know, all this stuff. Like, they do a really great job building. Because imagine if she presses a button and immediately, like, it, you know, it spits out paper and it goes in the wrong place. But no, at, at first it seems like it's going fine. And then, you know, I, th I, I think I know the problem. Somebody set that thing to evil. Seriously, that thing is possessed. I, I get... You you don't need to press the button. You need an exorcist. Let's see. And... Um, hmm. Right, yeah. And, and Richard says... I gotta go. Faster? That is correct. You have got to go. Just... Get out of here. And I, I really liked seeing Judy get better at the office work. And it's really, you know, it it is this thing of, yeah, you know, at first it might seem, you know, extremely, like, at, at first when, you know, the, the phone, she's like, oh, oh, yeah. And then she, like, I think she meant, she meant to put the person on hold, but, like, apparently accidentally hung up on them or something so that's not great you know but yeah later on you know she's got the thing so please hold please hold you know just completely has it under control you know like honestly you know i'm sure a lot of young women watched this and they were like oh i really i hope i never have to have a job like that and then over the course of the movie they realize oh wow judy has it down i guess i could too you know and that's you know, that's the idea with progressive media to, to make it clear, you know, you're, maybe you can do it. You're, you're, you know, maybe you're just the, the, maybe you just lack con, not, not competence, but confidence. And, you know, with stuff like Mr. Hart showing, don't do that, you know, don't be like that. That, yeah, I think I will just briefly, I, I, since I write down on paper, I try to write small so i um yeah so a couple of things that hart does he doesn't listen to the women you know when they you know violet makes a very yeah and she actually yeah he actually interrupts her doesn't he you know so yeah he doesn't listen even when they have something reasonable to say he doesn't he do, he clearly doesn't respect them when dora lee is angry at him he says, I love it when you're angry, which is just, don't, don't ever do that. Like, just, you know, respect a woman when she, when, when she expresses emotions that go against what you want. Just, yeah. Uh, let's see, he, yeah, so he, he peeks down Doralee's blouse. 
the let's see he even you know he plans out with the he he knows exactly how to set it up on the table so that he can knock over the pencils so that she'll be you know she'll get down on the floor just yeah let's see yeah he lied to to Dora Lee about the convention and it just yeah let's see I think yeah and so not not heart but the the um, ah, what's I I don't want to call his name, but Dora Lee has a husband, you know, and yeah, he's not paying attention to what she's saying, you know, he's just like, yeah, but I want to see you smile, though. I like it when you smile. I don't care about your problems, you know. Let's see. You know, apparently she is at least into him, so that's great, you know, and maybe he'll start listening after the events of, of this movie. Um, let's see, you know, and that's, yeah. When she, when when he says, you know, he he makes it pretty clear that he wants to have sex with her, she's into it. You know, she's not like, but but yeah, you know, that's, I think it, it helps illustrate, you know, she really does, like, she's used to people not taking her seriously. And once people do start taking her seriously, she does really well. You know, it's it's that kind of thing. You got to show... Yeah, show, show, you know, establish the problem, show the solution, and show the solution working. Not just, you know, oh, maybe we could do that. No, it's very important that people, you know, by the, like, seriously, if by the end of this movie you do not have any respect for, Lo, for, for Dora Lee still, you're a lost cause. I'm just saying, like, she is, she has, she, she's one of the ones who comes up with all the ideas, and she's the one who forges his signature, which without that, it, they wouldn't be able to get all these rule changes across. Now, let's see. So the... Yeah, I, I really appreciate, you know, the, the positive drug message during the war on drugs. Like, and apparently, like, and as, this is really hilarious. Apparently... I mean, it, it, it wasn't public at first. He just put it in the presidential li the, the uh, dictionary, not dictionary, uh, the journal, that's it, diary. But apparently, Reagan, you know, he was like, oh, you know, it was a pretty good movie. But, you know, he, he uh, had a conniption fit when the, when the pot came out. And it's like, but they're literally, like, I, I haven't done pot. Uh, I don't think it's legal around here but that's not the only reason I'm saying it that I haven't done it you know it's I don't think it's really my kind of thing but I have heard it you know it makes you, it it's opens your mind to thoughts that usually you wouldn't be very receptive to it's not you know not like a uh, science fiction thing but just you know stuff that you would usually repress Marijuana can, you know, just unlock and make you think, oh, wouldn't that be good, you know, and that's, yeah, you know, at, at first it's just that they, you know, they, they get the munchies and they, like, they talk about the things they wish they could do, you know, we, we get the three fantasy sequences, but later in the movie, you know, they're, they're doing things, like, at the start of the movie, they're not looking to get rid of Hart. They're just like, he really needs to stop doing this stuff. And, you know, he gets a chance to. He, he learns that they, like, thought they poisoned him. But it just makes him, you know, he, he continues to do evil things. And then they get rid of him. And I, you know, I suppose... I don't know, maybe it's a stretch. I think that they wouldn't have been open to these other solutions if they hadn't ever, you know, smoke pot or, you know, I guess possibly them getting drunk could also have, have done it, but they needed something to get them to change their thinking, and that is the thing, you know. The movie, you know, like, I, I get, you know, obviously, you know, apparently the, there's this one guy who showed this movie to his kids, and he's horrified that they're going to go out and do drugs now. You know, so, so yeah, for a PG rating, that is perhaps, yeah, I, I get that, but the movie does communicate the message, 
it's important to change our thinking when it comes to this because, you know, Violet has had a lot of, you know, for a lot of years, she's been working to, to get to the top of this place and she's not getting any further because of systemic sexism, you know. So, yeah, the, the thinking needs to be changed. And I suppose, ultimately, the movie doesn't really, you know, have a, have a definite solution, but... I've, um, you know, the, the movie, at, at the end, it says that they will still, you know, they'll, they'll continue to run things. Well, yeah, wait, wait. If I understand the ending correctly, I guess Violet is the new boss of the, she gets Hart's job, and that's because she did his job better than he did. She improved productivity, you know, so, yeah, yeah, that's it. The movie's saying, you know, okay, maybe you'll need to smoke some weed to get behind this, but hear me out on this. Doritos. No, no, uh, later. Female executives. Just hear me out on it. I, I think it could really, you know. And and the things that they, you know, it's it's not just this ridiculous claim I, I like that they made it it's it's credible 20 percent productivity yeah and the things that they they implement implemented you know it's that's that's the thing like when conservatives you know a lot of conservatives seem to think that we progressives want completely absurd things like i don't know everybody should get a personal jetpack or something but no we just want you know rules to to be changed so that there's more room for people who, you know, for, like the the they're at the end. You know, there's a there's a daycare center, so they don't have to worry about where what's happening with their kids while they're at work. Some people are working part time, which for some people just works better for the schedule. Uh, they have more flexible hours. Some people start working before nine and leave before five. Let's see. The there was there was one guy who was um, in a in a wheelchair, and he's working there. And it's yeah, you know, a lot of disabled people are happy to work. Not not all of them, for sure. You know, don't don't force them to work. If if they don't feel that they are up to to a, a job, you know, support them. The government should yeah, the government should support them. But the ones that do want to work you know yeah just let let them yeah let them work basically and let's see yeah, yeah eddie the black guy got to move out of the mail room even though the you know because they were open to you know they they because because yeah he looks at it and it's like oh it's not white and they look at it and he's working hard he's been working you know violet knows him he's been working hard for years you know, so yeah, those are the kinds of things that do increase productivity. It's a, it's a really, just some conservatives seem to think that the average worker is like a mule. You just gotta hit him really hard, and you know, not literally, but stick more than carrot is what they believe, and that's just not true. Like it's a really outdated idea that regular people don't like to work we're actually seeing like a number of seniors you know they they're not not in all countries but in some countries here in denmark there are a number of seniors who still want to work you know they they they've reached an age where like there's this idea that well you know you can't work as hard so just you know relax and enjoy your golden years and they're like i i gotta have something to do you know i i the the yeah, you know, I, I know people personally, you know, my, my father is retired, but he makes sure that he has stuff to do. He, he would, he would absolutely not be able to stand just sitting and, and doing nothing, you know, and, and for sure, some seniors do like just relaxing for the, the, you know, and, and like, if you live in a really hardcore capitalist society, you might not be able to work once you reach that that age, but yeah, the, there's a there's some really outdated ideas about what the you know how to get the best 
um, result. Uh, you know how to get the most. How to, how your workers will will do the most work, or or the yeah, it's not. How they will be the most productive because them showing up for there, there's a I, f I forget the number but there's there's studies done that show that if you work for X amount of hours then it actually you actually start becoming less productive because you need rest. But yeah, you know, near the end of the movie, th they say, well, the employees like these new rules, and Hart you know, says, well, I hate them, so I want them changed. You know, he doesn't care. He doesn't think that his employees should be happy at their job. Like, it's, yeah. Now, that brings us to... So yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Positive drug message during the war on drugs, gutsy and it's accurate. And I really appreciate that as soon as Doralee realizes the, the gossip, she goes to the source. She doesn't yell at Violet for believing gossip. She, you know, the moment she hears, mistress, what do you mean mistress? And, you know, at first Violet thinks that, she doesn't think it's a rumor, she thinks it's true. Or... Wait, are rumors ever true? What, whatever. Dora Lee says, who has been saying that? And when she hears that it's, uh, that it's Hart, then she, you know, she's not angry at Violet, she's angry at Hart. She's angry... <laughs> she's at Hart, she's angry. She's angry with Hart because it's the rumor that's been doing... You know, the fact that people believe believed the rumor is bad, but they wouldn't have believed the rumor at all if nobody had started the rumor. So I really appreciate that. And the... Yeah, so the, the pot leads to the... In the, their, the fantasy sequence was very, very satisfying seeing these versions of... And just, like, I'm not going to go beat by beat, I swear, because we'd be here forever, but just... They do a really good, like, the part where, let's see, if I recall, okay, if I recall correctly, we start with Judy, move on to Doralee, and end on Violet. So, the, yeah, and, you know, Judy, she imagines that they're, like, hunting, you know, and, and it's such a, the, the, uh, let's see. Yeah, the, you know, the entire office is hunting him, and, like, they film, like, like I mentioned in the review, the filming and editing here is extremely important. They filmed it, like, like if you just watch this part, if, if, actually, that would be interesting. Try to show just the, the part where he's being hunted, maybe, maybe not including Jane Fonda, but just the part where he's being hunted through the office, and ask someone... You know, and see if if someone thinks that it's just a scene and the whole movie's like that, or if they realize that it is, you know, it's it's someone's imagination because it really, like that part, it, yeah, you know, you if you if you turn that into a movie, you know, it could, yeah, that's I I really really love it. Jane Fonda like with the gun like the the so yeah I can't I can't quite act them out but she's got like. So she's got the rifle, and she, like, flips it. It's okay, it didn't break. That was really cool. Um, was there maybe a little bit of speeding up to, to make it? I it's, Certainly, it, it, it's impressive either way, even if she couldn't do it quite as fast as it looks. It just, it looked like in the editing, they sped a little bit of it up. Actually, that might... Come to think of it, that might be for a fact, actually, since clearly they are imagined, you know, they're, they're fantasies, they're not r reflecting reality. But yeah, I love that in her, you know, all of them imagine, or, or imagine, all of their fantasies include the fact that everyone at the office hates Hart. The fact that, like, the... the the thing that Judy wants is to be hyper competent, you know, which I think at this point she is with the, the work, but she wishes, 
you know, yeah, uh, you know, ultimately all three of them wish that they could get power over Hart, and all, all three of them involve that they would, you know, knock him off, but, and the, I really, I love, you know, she shoots several times with the, with the rifle, and, like, manages to get him, and, like, we get a close-up of his face, and he's like, you know, ah, and and then it zooms out, and it's you know his head is on the on the wall, like how he put a deer's head up there. That yeah, that was really great. Um, and and Doralee, you know, she her fantasy brings her closer to her roots, you know, and that's I do appreciate, you know, I I haven't watched any of her other movies. I don't know if she could drop the southern drawl that she's known for. You know, certainly, yeah. So the uh, one of the other movies is in Texas, so there that the drawl fits for there as well. Yeah, actually, I don't think we're ever really told, but I guess she probably moved to the city from the country. That's part of why she needs the job. She doesn't have a lot of contact. She doesn't have a network that she could really. It, yeah, and at the end of the movie, she becomes a country singer, which is cute and uh, meta. And, yeah, you know, that's the, like, um, what's the word? Uh, let's see. You know, she wishes she was more in touch with her, with her roots. And that's a clever thing to write for someone who is playing, you know, if you just, like, the moment that you hear Dolly Parton and office work, like, you wouldn't immediately think, like, even if you think that she's, that she's very capable of things that are difficult, you wouldn't necessarily think of her as working in an office. And, yeah, the the idea that, you know, yeah, she, she did it for a while, but she wishes she was more in touch with her roots. And, and, yeah, I appreciate, you know, at the end of the movie, Violet is uh, given the, the fat promotion that she has been deserving for years. You know, um, let's see... I'm not 100% certain if Judy is still working there. Certainly she she remarried. And that's, you know, she... The divorce wasn't her idea, but she's certainly not going back to Richard. You know, life without Richard is better. And... Yeah. The... the but, but yeah. You know, Dora Lee stops the... You know, stops the work. And, yeah, gets more in touch with her roots... And, yeah, that's really cool. You know, she imagines riding up on, on a horse and, like, the, the uh, what's it called? You know, she ends up, like, hog-tying him or whatever it's called, you know, the, the thing. And it is also, like, I gotta say, I cringed when she, and, and it was, um, you know, the movie wanted me to cringe when she was sexually harassing him. And I really appreciate, like... They could so easily have had it be, like, you know, because a lot of guys would be like, oh, I would love if, you know, Dolly Parton hit on me. Well, what if you had a partner that you loved and didn't want, you know, you didn't want to hurt her? So, you know, the the movie makes it, you know, oh, okay, so there's, obvi there's the joke where, you know, he is, like, resting against her, her bosom and the, the... Yeah, you know, that is obviously, he doesn't look so unhappy there, and he says he's he's okay with, with there, but other than that, you know, we're cringing, we're not like, ah, oh, that's so hot, it, I wish I could get objectified by her, you know, but, so, so that was, yeah, and then we have the, yeah, I, I really love how many times it's pointed out that he's a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. So if I, let's see if I remember, when the, yes, it starts when the, when the, uh, a Judy's fantasy sequence, you know, she, the, he's like, they're all out to get me and I don't know why. And then he, you know, she says, it's because you're a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. And then when, let's see, Ah, uh, is it Dora Lee who calls him that? Maybe. Oh, yeah. In Dora Lee's, it's the it's the announcer, uh, you know, who's like, oh, and she is hog tying that sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot, you know. And then when the 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 um yeah, moving on to the the final 
fantasy, which is pro I, I'm glad that they built to that one because it doesn't really get better than Lily Tomlin as Snow White with off-brand animated Disney animals help you know one of the one of the at least one of the birds I forget if I think it takes just one the, the one bird flies up with the with the spoon you know so that she can stir in the poison and and the just yeah, it's it's such a great, you know, because it's like, you know, in case it's been a while since you watched it, I'm pretty sure that's a reference to the, the uh, uh, let's see, is it, I, th I think it's birds and are they mice or are they rats? I guess probably rats as assembling the, the dress for Cinderella, you know, so... Yeah, it's like, ah, oh, you, you should go to the ball, you know. And here it's like, you should definitely poison your boss. I approve. Here, have this spoon so you can stir in the just, yeah. And, and you know, she takes, and, and the, you know, she puts it in and like, let's see, I think there's a, there's an announcer voice. Ah, what, what did it say? Like, so, some, some kind of exclamation of, of like, ah, that's yeah, horrible. And you get the skull and crossbones above it, and then she, she stirs and takes the spoon out. And it's apparently, like, so, okay, so it's not just strychnine. It's apparently, like, straight up some kind of acid that she mixed in. Just awesome. Absolutely loved it. And it, just the, the big smile she has on her face, which is, you know, because it is, like, He's mad that she's not, you know, I, I'm not sure he, does he tell her to smile? He probably tells her to smile at least one point. But that's, you know, he wants her to constantly be, you know, chipper. And, and just the big smile, the, the, you know, she goes in and, and he, he realizes the, the, there's, you know, my coffee was poisoned. I think you did it. And, and you know, and, and the, the chair now goes from just you know oh when he leans back on it it falls back over now she can like pull a lever and it sends him up and then you know prepares to shoot him and shoots him forward you know and just the whole thing and you know and and she's like i know why it's because i'm a sexist egotistical lying hypocritical bigot isn't it bingo and you know she pulls the lever and he goes flying out just amazing and then like the the other people all the all the office workers were like slaves in this version and the the chains spring off them and the door opens and like hallelujah and the whole thing you know and then all three of them are in like dresses from the the that time it just yeah it was it was so much fun i absolutely loved it and lily tomlin played it perfectly like look at the how different her face is during those and and like it's legitimately creepy like she's too chipper like nobody should smile like that that's not healthy that's like and and you know we know why it's because she's poisoning him you know that's <laughs> if someone smiles like that there might be they might be doing something that they really shouldn't and do not drink their coffee you know so and and yeah the difference between that and then her face when she says you understand zilch and let's see oh, right and i do want to acknowledge you know the reason that the they're off-brand disney animated but you know they did not want like obviously if people were like watching this and being like oh yeah i'm sure disney animals would be happy to help you poison your bot like you know, there's a reason that in those movies, it's the, the innocent protagonist who gets poisoned, not the, you know, so, so yeah. And, and, you know, you could still tell, okay, that's definitely, that's Bambi and that's Thumper. There's no doubt. And the birds just slightly different, but clearly they are the ones helping Cinderella. And let's see. Um, yeah, and, and the, let's see, the, um, what does that say? The, yeah, right, all of the women at this work, you know, Roz is the sole exception. All the other women support each other at work. It's not only the trio who support each other, and that, again, you know, sets up. That there is this, you know, it, it makes more sense 
to to have solidarity for for them to have solidarity with each other than to be competing because of the glass ceiling and all and Roz is the only person who is unhappy that Hart is at the hospital so that's yeah and Hart actually realizes that you know without a good without good health care a hospital can really you know set you back a lot a lot i think it's actually it's the only time he's right about anything so i don't know if maybe is the movie critical of that idea then is that the i don't know it just it feels a little weird that he's like I think it's the only thing that he's right about. I think every single other thing he says, you know, or maybe, maybe it's that he, you know, he's technically, he's accurate, but he doesn't think that anything should be done about it. He's just not going to do it himself. Like with how he says, you know, oh, you know, some of the investors just, they trust men more. And yeah, I mean, there's some truth to that, but that's like, the fact that something is bad right now is not a good argument for keeping it bad. That's that's such a terrible argument. If something's bad right now, that means we should put effort into fixing it so that it can be better in the future. There's no, you know... If something is bad right now, the only... I'm, I'm not... There, there are very few good arguments for keeping it that way. One of them would, of course, be there's just not something we can do about that right now. Like... You know, the, the, ah, yeah, I am not sure I have a good example right off the top of my head. Um, but, but yeah, you know, there are, like, actually, yeah, um, I don't know if there's something right now, but certainly, like, in the past, you know, um, a hundred years ago, you couldn't, not everyone could be, uh, like, um, you know, if, yeah, if you go far back enough in time, I'm not sure a hundred years is enough, but if you go far enough back in time, then you can't, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, a hundred years, you know, not everybody is going to have indoor plumbing. That just wasn't, you know, there wasn't a system in place for that, but today... It should, you know, we, we have, it's, you know, you people, we have a lot of places that have indoor plumbing and we have a lot of experts who can very quickly take care of, you know, improving, like, yeah, you know, like today, I, I'm not sure very many places are built that don't have indoor plumbing. So today, there's no good reason why, you know. Today, even if you are poor, you know, the government should make sure that you have access to indoor plumbing. Now, let's see. You know, if anything, the fact that something is bad right now or was bad before should make us even more motivated to make things better. Like, it, you know... I'm always amazed, like, the same people who say, oh, you know, things are bad right now, so I guess we can't improve, are the same people who say, oh, you know, America's the best country in the world, and it's because we can solve any problem that, you know, somehow the prob the, any problem does not include the problems that they don't personally feel affected by. Now, let's see, the... Um... Okay, what is the... Okay, I'm struggling to read my own notes here. Um, right, right, yeah, the, 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 um, you know, yeah, Hart, the, the various people, like, it seems like Roz is the only person who's upset that something happened to Hart, like, on principle, you know, Violet is only upset when she thinks it was her. Um, but the, the yeah, 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 because we actually, you know, she comes back and is like, oh, you missed all the excitement. 
uh, Hart went to the hospital and she, uh, okay, you know, and then she goes in and then she realizes, oh no, the, you know, the poison. If Hart was, you know, was a good person, a good boss, a pleasant boss, you know, they, they would all be devastated about it. Yeah, actually, then it, it would be like, it would basically be impossible to get the body out of there because several of the others, you know, the, the women would, yeah, yeah the, the female employees of Hart would go there and be like, is he okay? You know, constantly like asking, but no, instead it's only the trio who go there. You know, Dora Lee basically feels like she has to, she, she was the one who found him like that. And the other two go there because of the poison. And because of that, they're able to, to wheel out this, this other body, which, you know, at the end of the day, doesn't... the, the um, Let's see. Yeah, it leads to him being... You know, he, he reveals to them that he knows, and then they kidnap him. That wouldn't have been possible if the... the yeah. If, if people were worried about him, they would... You know, they they would start saying to Dora Lee, you know, you have to tell me what's really going on. You know, anyway, let's see. So yeah, um, Violet grabbing the body is really really funny. It's so dark, but it's so funny. I love that there's this one angle where it kind of looks like it's her feet sticking out from the. It just, it's really really funny, and I love how she's just married to the cement idea like you know once she's out there she's like okay look you're you guys are being you gals are being ridiculous here look all we got i i have it planned out all we got to do cement shoes down into the water they not they never found jimmy hoffa you know and you know when, when she's presented that plan they're like arguing and she's like okay please focus where do we get cement? You know, she's completely married. She's she's not like having second thoughts or something. No, no, no. She 100% just cement. Where? We just, it's, it's completely settled. We got to do it like this. And I really love the, the different reactions that they have to the body. Like, you know, it's like, okay, we, we got to deal with that thing. Um, there's a... There's a tire iron in the back, you know, and opens, you know, and and looks for the, the tire iron, and that's not the body that was supposed to be there. Um, Judy, would you come out here and have a quick look? And, and you know, she's like, what's that? Where's heart... <laughs> You know, because, like, understandably, she doesn't put two and two together right away. So she's like, how many bodies did Violet steal? Yeesh. What did this guy even do? Come on, we gotta, we gotta figure this you know. Say, uh, Violet, would you come around here and take a quick look? And she's also like, that wasn't, you know. And I, I really love the exchange, you know. I guess I made him. I must have made a mistake. I must have made a mistake. You stole the wrong body from the hospital, and all you can say is I must have made a mistake. <laughs> very, very funny, and and just yeah. Let's see. And I really appreciate that you know they are all in it together. You know, and and yeah, the once once like Violet and and Doralee start bickering. You know, then Judy is the one who's like, no, we, we got to keep, you know, so she like says, we got to put him on, you know, stop arguing. We got to put him move on. And she slams the, the, um, what's it called? The, the trunk shot. And it is like, you know, like these are not that they, they wouldn't normally like being yelled at even by a fellow woman, but she has a point, you know, there's, they know, they're not going to get anything out of biggering. They have to. You know, they, they have to get back with the body. That's just, that's the only thing that makes any sense. They can't just, so, so yeah, you know, and the, the, I, I really love that when the, when they realize there's a, a cop behind them, you know, Violet is like, should I make a break for it? And Dora Lee's like, I got my gun. <laughs> like, there is some version of this movie where, like, like, for, for maybe 
30 seconds. The two of them, in their mind. I mean, I guess, I don't know. Um, any of you gals watched Bonnie and Clyde? Let's, let's, you know, not everybody gets to have a happy ending, I guess. Just it, really, really funny that they're like, they're, they're gonna try to drive away from the cop, maybe take some pot shots from the, the, when it just, oh my, just, yeah, absolutely love that that's, that's where their mind goes with the, and I really appreciate that Violet's quick thinking and the doctor's badge equals respect. You know, the, the, like, imagine if she just clammed up, then they'd be like, why is, why are you wheeling around the body? Wait, I haven't seen you here before. Are you sure you're a doctor? You know, but because she's, you know, yeah, some of the things she says is kind of ridiculous. You know, I'm taking out from air. I mean, I'm getting some air. He's just coming with me. How did he die? Too much coffee. Let's see. And I really, really love that, you know, they're, they're in the bathroom talking about the... Which is also, I, I really appreciate, you know, they... Like, obviously, the thing about you have to look for Roz's legs in the in in the stalls before you talk in the bathroom but yeah apparently people talk about I, I mean i guess it makes sense i've i've never worked a regular office job like that so yeah but yeah um people talk with their their colleagues in the in the bathroom about things that they couldn't talk about you know in a in a less private setting so just yeah and and you know I forget, you know, one of them's like, are we sure that Roz isn't here? Have, have anybody checked for, for her legs under the stall? You know, and the, no, 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 her legs are not visible under any of the stalls. And they talk about the whole thing. And then the camera moves up. And Roz is, like, hunched. And, and she's, like, got her legs up against the wall. So they can't see. And then she's, like, sitting there writing in pen on toilet paper. It's like, Wow. You are devoted, like, holy crap. Just, yeah. And, yeah, you know, Mr. Hart gets a lot of the details. You know, a couple of them, difficult to make out because they're written. I would never want to, like, it's it's already difficult to write on something like, like, like tissue paper. Like, I've been in a situation where the only thing I could write on was tissue paper. It's difficult trying to do it with a pen because like the pen is basically cutting holes in the paper you know so and and we do also see that when she's sitting there like part of the paper she accidentally cut with the the pen so it's just yeah mr hart gets a bunch of the details not all of them and it doesn't lead to self-reflection in fact he decides to try to take advantage of the trio you know i just want to put out there hypothetically if I found out someone had tried to kill me, don't you know? Obviously, I'd be upset. Even if that person had never before seen me, very upset. But part of me would definitely go for some self-reflection and be like, "What on earth did I do that would make them so angry?" that they would want to kill me. But, yeah, it in no way does he consider just, yeah. Mr. Hart, I'm begging you, take the vaccine. I really love the the wordplay of, you know, uh, can I see Mr. Hart? Oh, he's all tied up at the moment. That's true. And, and earlier, you know, Roz was like, did you get that memo? And Violet's like, I tore right through it. <laughs> And, like, Roz is like, oh, great, I'm glad you read the whole thing. Whereas we, of course, know, no, 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 literally, like, she... Do I have any... You know, she, she got the memo, oh, yeah, and the moment Roz turned away, tore right through it. So, it just, yeah. And... And I, I appreciate this this detail of, you know... What was the, um, let's see, yeah, Mr. Hart gives his word of honor and immediately breaks it, you know, he, yeah, 
and and Dora Lee's monologue to him, you are rotten. I never thought I'd say that about another person, but you are rotten. You are evil. I don't know if you were born this way or if you actually had to work it for it. <laughs> I mean, I don't believe that anybody's genetically evil, but I find it hard to believe that he does a lot of work. And yeah, you know, like... The trio do some very wrong things by accident or to, you know, in order to, to not, you know, end up being, you know, put away for a crime they didn't mean to commit. And Mr. Hart does evil on purpose. And I really like that he's actually, you know, he's a, he's a victim of his own success, really. Because they gag him with the scarf that he had the, the you know, Dora Lee wouldn't have had anything to gag him with if he hadn't forced Violet to buy a scarf, claiming it was for his wife, and then gifted it to Dora Lee. And if his house wasn't so isolated, which, you know, rich people like, you know, people might hear him yell, so they wouldn't know where to put him. So all these things just, yeah. Let's see. I really appreciate that the the three women discuss what to do. You know, it's it's not it. Uh, yeah, the three of them are basically equals. Like they they have access to different. You know, Dora Lee. You know, what, what was her line? Asan, Asan, his name better than he does. So you know, yeah, she has the she can do that, and the other two never doubt that. And, you know, Violet has, like, an overview, and she's the one who talks to... Like, the others don't doubt that she can contact the, you know, for the for the, um, the invoices, uh, you know. The, 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 like, imagine, it, it would so... In, in so many movies, they, they would be bickering because some misogynists think that women can't work together, which is just because they don't want women to work together against men. So, you know, you could very easily have had it that the others were constantly hounding Dora Lee about how good, you know, they, they were, like, criticizing the, the um, what's it called? They, they didn't think that the, ah, I can't believe I'm blanking on the word, signature. They, they didn't think the signature was good enough, or the, or the others were hounding Violet about, are you sure the office can't get it in time? Let, let me talk to them, you know, so... Let's see. I really appreciate that the movie doesn't have male gaze, and you know, really, Dora Lee isn't dressed inappropriately. Like the only the only time you can see cleavage is when she bends over. You know, it's the movie makes it clear, and the only time it ogles it is a basically a point of view shot from him. Practically, you know, the movie makes it clear that she's not doing anything wrong. She's not asking for it. And I gotta say, the, the S&M suit legitimately is very funny. And I'm pretty, Okay, so, let's see. The, there's, the, there's the suit that, like, the guys hang... From, oh, yeah, yeah, like, I guess... Yeah, there's, it's some kind of sports thing, I think. And then they combine it with the, the leash... Uh, not leash. Uh, yeah, the thing that goes around the neck of the collar? For the, for the dog. And, um, what was the third thing? The chain. You know, that's really, and, and that it, like, Dora Lee is like, okay, I'm gonna chain him up with this, you know, that's, yeah, at, at, at this point, like, he's, he's had his chances, you know, he's, she's, she's seen through a, you know, there's a lot of things he's done that she's forgiven, no more. This, now, it's time for chains, you know, so that's, yeah, um, and the, uh, what was it called? The, um, and yeah, and yeah, so so Dora Lee to sell it to Roz, you know, she's like, well, he must have not left for lunch because his jacket is right there. I've told him that this is not this is not safe, you know, and she picks up the, the cigar that he left that is still, you know, clear, clearly he smoked on this very recently, so yeah, you know, Roz, she basically doesn't have enough faith in the trio to think that they could actually do this, you know, she accepts these couple of, of pieces of evidence, you know, and the, oh, um, 
Judy! Is Mr. Hart there? Oh, yes, he is. You know, oh, maybe maybe you can just catch him. He's in the elevator. You know, and, and Roz takes off running and and, viol and the door just barely closes. And, and Judy's like, I guess you just missed him. <laughs> Absolutely love the, yeah. And let's see. Yeah, you know, basically... Hart has treated his workers badly as their boss, and it's backfiring. You know, they wouldn't... Like, imagine if Roz was not the only... Imagine if the trio were the only three people in the office who didn't like Hart. They wouldn't have been able to, to get away with as much, but... You know, they... Like, basically, the... the you know, and clearly the women do... The, the other women do think that it is Hart... Because the, um, I want to say Margaret, thanks him for instituting the, the uh, what was it, alcohol, um, alcohol uh, uh, re uh, treatment, you know, something like that. So, yeah, but, you know, the women are basically like, I don't know what's gotten into Mr. Hart, but I hope it stays there, you know. The, uh, yeah. And, Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a shot before they send Roz away. I think it is, but because they had to, you know, do a lot of running to to keep the, you know, yeah, the the heart, um, what's it called, to keep it, to keep Roz thinking that heart was there. Um, they had to do a bunch of running. So there's this shot where you see their shoes on the on the floor, and they're sitting on like the couch in Hart's office. I think it is. And, you know, yeah, they, they took their shoes off because their feet hurt because they've, you know, they're working hard. I, again, like, it's pos I guess it's possible that it's Colin Higgins, but I would, if I had to guess, I would say that was probably... Uh, there we go. That was probably Patricia Resnick. And, yeah, I, I do not speak from experience, but I can imagine... I've, I've heard that women's shoes are, you know... Um, ah, what's the word? Like, uh, they're harder to walk in than, than men's shoes. And, let's see... So, so yeah, the uh, I mentioned there's some really great smash cut jokes. There's the... in, in the review. So, yeah, you, you have... you know, Mr. Hart is like... Do you really think people aren't going to notice that I'm missing? You know, I'm the boss. That I'm missing. People are going to notice that I'm missing. Smash cut, and they're making sure that you know the the. Actually, was that the one with Roz? Maybe I. Anyway, but there's there's that, and then there's the. Ah, uh, crap! I I'm struggling to recall others right now. Um, let's see. There's there's. That one and those. Um, huh. That might be. And anyway. Um, yeah, and you know the rule changes make the employees happy. So you know, the, yeah, great to see. And I swear, I I I figure Earl Bowen can and has played characters who aren't, like, really, like, that the audience doesn't, like, just love to hate, but I haven't seen it yet, you know, at least in this, this time, it doesn't lead to anything really bad, but he is still, like, spying on people, that's really creepy, just, yeah, you know, whether he's saying, you broke my arm, or Threepwood, we love to hate him, and I, I really do. He is he is such a fun antagonist character. And let's see, yeah, and and Richard stalks his ex, which yeah, a, a number of men do. It's it's really really creepy. And yeah, uh, the movie features a lot of instances of toxic masculinity. Where, you know, yeah, I, I mentioned some earlier. Some of the others are that Hart will 
you know, touch one of the, the women unwantedly. He'll stare. The way he talks to and about them, you know, the calling them his girls. And when he tells Roz to fire that woman who was talking about the salary, which, like... She's not asking, again, she's not asking for a personal jetpack. She's just like, I can barely, you know, she talks about she she want, she wishes she could spend more time with her, her family, her, her kids. And, you know, yeah, it makes sense to, to think about salary as a, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe try to get a raise so that that can at least help make up some for the the lost time uh, you know but yeah and let's see i i quite enjoyed when the the, the yeah i i saw one of one of the critics said that there was yeah the thing that he let's see um he said that there was um I think it was here. Yeah, uh, the hospital sequence, the scenes in and outside of the car were tedious. I disagree. And he said there are too many scenes of Coleman in his odd S and M getup. If the if it didn't, um, but each time something changes. You know, it's not just the same thing over and over. Um, let's see, you know, early, we, we see from very early on that he's trying to get out of it, but that he has difficulty getting out of it. And then later we're seeing that he, you know, he finds the, was a nail file or something and cuts through. Um, let's see. And yeah, he wishes it was more episodic instead of settling into the story angle about the rat poison. I thought the rat poison thing worked. Um, but yeah, the... See the um, um yeah yeah when when the when Judy catches Hart trying to get out of the of of the get up and like she's like hitting him with like a pillow or something and he's like struggling trying to get down from there so, like let's see she she presses the button so he goes up hanging there. But he's gotten out of some of it, so he's like trying to fight back, and she manages to restrain him. And and Richard thinks it's a sex thing because, of course, his mind goes there. And to be fair, does look like a sex thing. It does really look like an S and M getup. And then Richard shames Judith, Judy for you know the sex. It's none of his business, and she's not hurting anyone. Like, I don't think he even... Yeah, he's not, like, bothered by... Wait, are you hurting that guy? He's just like, I can't believe you're having non-heteronormative sex without me? You know, so just, yeah. And I really loved her rejecting him. Just so satisfying. The You know, well, I guess there's nothing left to say then. Except this. This is where you get off, Buster. Just, yeah, absolutely love that. And according to a, a reaction video, there's apparently, like, in the musical, she she was in the musical, and apparently there's a song there that she really loved, and she wanted to play Judith for that. That makes perfect sense. I could totally see how that turned into a big, like, empowerment song, so that's great. Poor Missy, still naive. And... Yeah, the movie has a lot of setup and payoff. I think everything, everything that sets up, there's payoff to, and everything, every big joke has some setup to it. And we see that the let's see, yeah, I I really love that you know because these rules are so popular with the colonel, you know, Violet has to explain to him, and he you know. Hart has to characterize it as, oh, she's my right arm, basically, you know, so why don't you explain the thing to, you know, because he has no idea, you know, he, he wants to take credit, that's, we, we've seen that before, he likes taking credit for other people's ideas, but he can't do it if he doesn't understand the idea, you know, the other thing, that, that was the, the other time, she gave him the, like, a, a memo that explained the idea, so he, you know, he read it carefully, 
and ex, you know and and claimed that the idea you know so when he explained the idea to the other guy he understood it but here he he has a case where you know he's he's too proud to just say i didn't make those changes they were made against my will because then he'd have to imagine and he'd have to admit women did a better job at my job than i did and he would not be able to that just he he would never be able to like face anyone for the rest of his life if he actually admitted that a woman did his job better than he did a woman that had worked there longer was you know so yeah and violet explains and and the the colonel is straight up like wow i no wonder she's your right arm she's smart Let's see, and the, yeah, the, the one's alcoholism was fixed. The, the end part with Brazil, like, the thing about him being, you know, abducted by an Amazon tribe, that is unfortunate racism, and it's completely unnecessary. I, I think it would have been great if he did go to Brazil... But then he was fired when they saw how useless he was because he was trying to do things the way he did back in in the office, and without Violet, you know things fell apart. That 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 kind of thing, you know, I, that would have then then you wouldn't have the the racism of it. And it's you know it's it's a move that understands that racism is bad because earlier, you know, he specifically I'm not going to repeat the word. Because it is, um, ah, okay. He says that he doesn't want to spend all that time on the boat. And he specifically says that it is, the, the boat, he characterizes it, uh, characterizes it as, I'm going to spell it, D-A-G-O. And so, so, you know, he's racist. But then, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Some some people think that, well, it's funny if he becomes victim of a racist trope because he's racist. And it's just, I, I think it it's better to just not have the racist trope. And, yeah, do love seeing the, you know, the end where they say this is just the beginning. And Roz returns mad. And... Let's see. Yeah, and and Judy remarries. We're told at the at the end. So it wasn't that marriage was necessarily wrong for her. It was that Richard was the wrong husband, and I think that's fine because it doesn't say that there's something wrong with Violet not being married. You know, she like she's she's a widow. You know, she did she didn't get divorced. And at no point in the movie does she, like, you know, she, she never seems like, oh, I wish I had a man. No, it's not, you know. So the, the, the movie isn't saying that to be a woman, you have to be married. But it's also not saying you can't be married. If you, if you want to be a, a woman, if you want respect, you, you have to stay single, you know. Because that is also, uh, like... As, as long as the, the marriage is a, a happy one, as long as she's married to, as, as the woman is married to a man that she wants to be married to, and marriage is something she wants, and, you know, with, like, Judy, like, she has the, the job. It, it, like I said, I, it's not quite clear if she's still working after or if she returns to being a homemaker. But certainly, you know, there was a while where she wasn't married, and she was fine. You know, she got along better with uh, Dora Lee and, and Violet than she did with, with Richard. Uh, you know, so the... I'm guessing. Obviously, we don't actually see what she and Richard were like before the, the divorce. But, yeah. And that is it for this section so i am gonna get into the final section holy crap this video got much longer than i thought it was gonna that's not the section i am the section is called notes taken before watching so that brings us to 
There we go. So yeah, the movie makes it clear how hard the women work. When the boss goes missing, most people don't realize he's gone because the work is getting done by the women who weren't getting credit. And Orly literally does... Uh, oh, yeah, I already mentioned that. Right, and yeah, even after divorcing her, Richard continues to act possessive of Judy, stalking her, pushing her to let him in, thinking they can get back together. He's very misogynistic. And yeah, you know, that's there's there's so many... American stories where it's like, oh, you know, they split apart. Oh, they got back together. It's so amazing. And sometimes that is great. But sometimes it is better to put a relationship behind you. And yeah. So the, yeah. Sterling Hayden plays Russell Tinsworthy, consolidated as chairman of the board who spends most of his time in Brazil, he does a really great job. Um, I didn't want to mention him in the review itself, because if you know that he's going to be in the movie, then you might spend the entire movie just waiting for him to show up. And when I talked about the ending, I didn't say that there wasn't Deus Ex Machina, because I think, arguably, him showing up like that is kind of a Deus Ex Machina. Certainly, they didn't establish that he was paying attention to what was happening in the office. So, you know, it's like we see Earl Bowen taking notes and then like five minutes later, the, the or maybe more, but yeah. And according to IMDb Trivia, Gregory Peck and Charlton Heston turned down the role of chairman of the board, Russell Tinsworthy. I could definitely see them. Um, yeah. 100%. They could have they could have done it well. Um, I don't know Sterling Hayden from anything else, but I do think he does a good job. Now, let's see. So, I'm to be trivia says that critics complained that while the first part of the movie was cool, dark and edgy, exploring topical issues like wage discrimination and harassment, part 2 ge degenerates into sitcomish farce. That's probably because the original script was much darker. In the original script, the women do try to murder the boss, and then everything goes foul at that point, forcing the women to kidnap their would-be murder victim. This causes all sorts of mayhem, sustains the dark energy momentum of the beginning, but it was probably decided this was too edgy, and they softened it into a comedy of errors to make it palatable for mainstream audiences. Critics initially poo-pooed the ending, but it didn't matter. The movie became a blockbuster and a cult hit as well, and is now known as one of the funniest movies ever made. Rightly so. Yeah, um, you can easily see, like, this could, it could very easily have been turned into, like, honestly, I'll, I'll grant that the thing with, you know, it is, it is funny that the rat poison and the, was it coffee whitener, thinner? I, I, I'm, I don't drink coffee, so I don't know, but the, you know, it is funny that the boxes look so much, you know, look so similar, and it is great because we see the the box of of you know for the coffee very early on, and it's poured in. You know, it, yeah, it's. I think when Doralee goes into to get get the coffee for Hart very very early on, and then you know Violet says, "Ah, oh, we need we need rat poison and coffee thinner." And then when you know she comes back, we you know. After she pours something in from from the yellow box, which we saw earlier was coffee thinner, she pours some of that into the coffee, and she leaves, and the camera pans down, and we see that it's rat poison. So, and then when she goes into her locker, she finds the coffee thinner, which obviously, you know, she was gonna put the rat poison under lock and key in the in the locker. So. You know, she's not going to leave rat poison standing out, even if it's only a place where adults, you know, just, just to be safe. But, yeah, um, you could very easily see how the, the yeah, you could you could change that to she, she did poison the coffee, but then instead of him drinking any, he, you know, the, the chair does the thing, so he falls. And the, yeah, you know, but... Yeah, I, th I think it would be... Well, actually, yeah, there's probably movies where it is... I haven't watched Horrible Bosses, but I'm fairly certain that they have... I don't know if it's murder, but they have plans. Like, they they, they have some pretty intense plans. So that, you know, that, that idea has been explored in other movies. I Yeah, ultimately, like, it's probably... 
I don't know if it would be that interesting to do today one where it is like they do intend to to kill you know at, at the end of the day I think it's probably better this way because the you know as it is now we get you know we see that the the you know like basically the worst thing they do on purpose is kidnapping you know they they don't do anything worse than that on you know judy you know panics and tries shooting him but she can't even look you know so the the and Doralee ties him up sure but only because he won't listen uh, you know just to get to uh, don't try that at home kids no the the it's because he he insists that he's going to you know to to reveal what they did when all she wants is for him to listen to to the you know the explanation uh, yeah the worst thing they do is is kidnap him and the, you know he has cigars he has days of our lives as the days of his life you know the the they only put him in the harness when he won't behave um let's see other, yeah other than that like they just they keep watch on him you know he um the they yeah i'm i they must be feeding him and and giving him something to drink also otherwise like he would definitely be pretty messed up after so yeah and he he would die if, if 3 days passed without him drinking anything so anyway yeah um because the the as it is the movie the trio don't really do anything evil for the wrong reason the the um let's see you know basically the everything they do in the second half of the movie starts with we don't want to go to jail you know we shouldn't have to go to jail because of a mix up nobody meant to poison him really you know so the um let's see um as a piece of progressive media that's trying to say here's the solution to things i do really appreciate that they don't intend to hurt him you know they they fantasize about it but everyone fantasizes about doing something that they know they shouldn't that doesn't mean we go out and do it you know and the yeah i i really i i ultimately i'm glad that that decision was made but for sure it does you can tell it it was that it was changed that it wasn't how the movie was originally conceived and um let's see yeah yeah um more IMDb trivia. In an interview, Tomlin admitted to, to embellishing one line, but it's clear she improvised a big chunk of the dialogue. Many of the jokes are so Tomlin-esque, and they're a little sharper and more sarcastic than the one-liners Patricia Resnick has stacked in there. They're also more sarcastic than the normally professional button-down Violet would have come up with on her own. Examples, uh, the... Yeah, calling the joint maui Wowie, Classic Tomlin silliness and sarcasm. And, yeah, when, when Elizabeth Wilson says, as Mr. Hart says, and Tomlin mocks her by lip-syncing her as she says it. Again, that's classic Tomlin. Or when Tomlin, dressed up as Snow White, says, thank you, in a weird, hyped-up voice, like a drunk stewardess. It's clear she's embellishing the script here. Also, when the traffic cop asks her if, if she's a doctor and she holds up the name tag and says, what do you think I am, a beautician? Or when the candy striper at the hospital says, oh, you're a doctor, I'm sorry I didn't see, and then she comes back with, yeah, I'm a doctor, so what am I talking to you for? Piss off. Those comebacks have the snarkiness of her Ernestine character. It's pretty clear she made them up on set. Let's see, and... Yeah, um... Judy's evil ex-husband is played by ubiquitous. Yeah, it points out that his real name, which I'm not going to be repeating here since this is a PG video. Yeah, his his the the name he has in the movie because, I mean, at that point, it must not have been considered offensive yet, right? I I um. I'll just really quickly do a, let's see, 
Really? Huh. Um. Okay, so, so, yeah, apparently, mid-17th century, the D word. But then, apparently, um... Because, like, Nixon was also, um, you know, they called him Tricky hmm, in the paper, so that must not have been, anyway. Richard is played by ubiquitous 70s and 80s character actor Lawrence Pressman. Just like Dabney Coleman was always typecast as Smarmy Boss. 9 to 5, Buffalo Bill and War Games. Elizabeth Wilson was always typecast as a persnickety busybody. 9 to 5, The Graduate. Oh, wow, I don't remember her in The Graduate. It's, it's, I haven't watched The Graduate in like 10 years, so, yeah. Henry Jones also always plays some old conservative uptight fuddy-duddy. Napoleon and Samantha will success. Spoiler Rock Hunter. Lily Tomlin always plays some crazy and eccentric... Uh, person of some sort, 9-5, big business grandma, incredible shrinking woman, shortcuts. Lawrence Pressman always played some predatory office creep of some sort. MASH, one day at a time, 9-5, Jane Fonda, however, was playing against type for this woman. She usually plays an outspoken firebrand, China Syndrome, they shoot horses. To oh, that's right, they shoot horses, yeah. On Golden Pond, the dollmaker, Agnes of God, Clute. But in this movie, she plays a conservative mousy frump, who pretty much stays that way throughout the movie, except in the confrontation seen at Hart's mansion when she tells her lecherous husband this is where you get off buster that's her one jane fonda moment now let's see um yeah so so one critic says that the office is transformed into a politically correct nightmare. Wow. Um, I hope you don't have any kind of executive managerial power. Holy crap. I like how this other critic puts it. Uh, let's see. Uh, the women... Yeah, conditions in the office improve significantly with such innovative and welcome changes as daycare, flexible hours, and a feeling of being valued by the company. Let's see. Um... Uh, let's see. Um... Okay, um... The film also does a great job of exploring all the different types of misogynistic people. There are the overtly sexist bosses, the sta stalking ex-husbands, even the women who use their power to tear down other women for their own personal gain. Each type has their prejudices addressed without forcing the audience to feel sympathy for any of them. Let's see. And... Right, yeah, there's one critic who says that, you know, he, he questions, or, yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming this is a guy. He says that the 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 last chunk of the movie doesn't make sense, saying, you know, morale in the office increases as does productivity because everyone knows that people work harder when there is no one around to hold them accountable. Yeah, right. The reason is that the employees feel valued, which they didn't when Mr. Hart was there. He had his chance. People work harder when they are treated humanely. The, that's just a fact. Like, there's there's studies that prove this. I'm also not entirely sure what makes this individual convinced there's no accountability. I feel like the trio that we follow work to ensure accountability by themselves talking to employees and just claim that they're speaking on Hart's behalf. And yeah, you know, 
because nobody but Roz wants to talk directly to Mr. Hart, they're probably like, oh, okay, thank you for telling me. You know, I'm sure Mr. Hart would have been shouting at me and saying sexist things. So I'm glad you t t took, you know, you, you handled it instead of him. That is it for the video, which is at least twice as long as I thought it was going to be. So, yeah, what can I say? The movie really, absolutely, I really, really resonated with me. So, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie similar to this. What, you know, what would you like to see in a new 9 to 5 movie or just a, you know, spiritual successor? Uh, yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one to more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And as soon as the the um, we're getting more live action Star Wars and MCU Disney Plus shows, I will also you know do a video on each episode of those. And as soon as I'm caught up on animated Star Wars, I will also talk about the more recent animated Star Wars movies uh, shows. But I only just got started. You know, I'm I'm doing season two of the Clone Wars now. But I watch about two episodes per day, so, you know, eventually I'll be caught up, and then I will talk about the current ones. Recently, the Review and Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, which was Catch My Movie next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Bye.